Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 read, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. That's what Proverbs says. What I say is that if anybody ever tells you not to think about something, that's the thing that you need to be thinking about the most, and that's the person that you need to be trusting the least. You see, thinking isn't just a fun buzzword. It, it actually is a really important thing that everybody should be doing about pretty much everything all the time. And if somebody's going to tell you, you're too dumb to understand this, just don't think about it, that's very different than saying, listen, this is something that's a little bit out of your area of expertise, you're not familiar with, you're ignorant about, so leave it to the experts. These are very, very different things. That verse is deliberately telling you not to use your brain, and that is seriously scary. But if you think that I'm misinterpreting this or, or misreading uh, it, or maybe I'm just not understanding the bigger picture, the bigger message, or maybe you have some access to some divine knowledge that I don't have access to, if you think that I'm being unfair with this verse, then call in, because the show starts right now. Greetings! Welcome to the Atheist Experience. Uh, today is J March 10th, 2024, um, and we've got a great show for you tonight. Uh, I'm joined today by Emma Thorne. Emma Thorne, everybody. Uh, you and I, I've wanted to work Hi. with you for a little while. I've heard so many great things, and Aww. as we've been chatting before the show, I'm, I'm just loving everything I'm learning about you. Um, so I'm super stoked for today. Um, before we get started, i got to let everybody know that the Atheist Experience is a product of the Atheist Community of Austin, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to the promotion of atheism, critical thinking, secular humanism, and the separation of religion and government. Before we get started, also, uh, i got to let you guys know about the question of the week, the, which is something that we've been doing this, this new Share Your Experience experience thing uh, where we give you a question, you answer the question down in the comments, and then we read your answers here live when we start the new show. Last week, we asked, complete this sentence, I was crucified and sent to hell, and all I got was blank. And we got three responses, uh, or, or pardon me, our top three responses. Number three here is, I, I was crucified and sent to hell, and all I got were these damn holes in my hands. I love the hand holes. I love the hand holes for so many reasons. I love the the story of Thomas when when Jesus comes back and all the apostles are like, yo, Jesus is back. And Thomas is like, prove it. Let me put my fingers in his hand holes. And Jesus shows up and is like, yo, finger my hand holes, bro. And he does. Uh. And then he believes. And that, like just and it says immediately after that verse, it says, uh, and then Jesus proved himself to them in many other ways, which I won't write here. And they just don't mention the rest. And it's okay. And then they're like, yeah, but you, though, 2,000 years in the future, you need to believe blindly and not ask any questions. Thomas got to finger the holes. But you, you just get my word for it. That's what you get. Uh, then we got number two. I was crucified and sent to hell. And all I got was a lousy case of, oh, my God, what is that word? <laughs> no, I got you. I got you, fam. Uh, Numo, I'm, it's so far away from me. Numo <laughs> ultra microscopic silico volcano coniosis. So that sounds just by the root words in there. That sounds like we're talking about like little volcanic bits of silicate. So like the the kind of glass ash pneumo getting in your lungs and causing inflammation. Isn't that how a lot of dinosaurs died? There isn't, there, do we have evidence of like the, the, the raining tiny microscopic particles of glass getting all up in your lungs and, 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 and shredding your lungs from the inside and you die drowning in your own lung juices? Bad way to die. Yeah, it's a thing. Uh, and it's, <laughs> that's what that word sounds like, y'all. Who knows? I'm just here. Uh, and then finally, we've got Blake Walker, uh, 5954, with the number one uh, comment saying, I was crucified and went to hell, and all I got was this Welcome to Florida t-shirt. That's what you should really be scared of. Florida's Aww. a real place. Poor Everyone, Florida. Yeah, be, be aware. Be advised. Florida's still <laughs> there, y'all. <laughs> Lock your doors. <laughs> um, Florida, you know what's crazy is that this entire continent of North America, the one that you're not on, is 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 a basically a teeter totter. And and during the last ice age, 
at the last glacial maximum, the uh, uh, the weight of the glaciers on the northern half of the continent, which, by the way, is where we get the Great Lakes from. Those are like scars from those glaciers moving and then melting and filling in that area. Cool. Um, but uh, the sheer massive weight of those glaciers uh, actually caused pressure that literally like tilted our continent oh and God. pulled Florida up from the bowels of the Cthulhu like <laughs> deeps from whence it came. So next time wow. you hear a news story about a man who strapped a rocket engine to a jet ski to launch it off of some aluminum siding over a fence to disrupt his cousin's wedding at the dog fighting ring next door. That's because of the ice age. That shit all happened because of the time when mammoths were about real cool stuff happened in the Pleistocene y'all. Um, with that, those are all the pre-show <laughs> announcements um, that I forget to do all the time. Uh, I now want to ask, how are you, Emma Thorne? Thank you so much I'm for being great. with us today. I've learned like five science facts already. I'm having a great time. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, man, I, I love it. It's, it's, it's what a great show that we get to be uh, this for a living. <laughs> Whatever this is. <laughs> Whatever this is. Um, we've already got some great calls on the line and I'm excited to get to them. But as always, um, the lines are open and we prioritize theist callers. So as I said at the beginning of the show, if you think that, you know, we're wrong or we're missing something about the Bible or about God or about Jesus or about Muhammad or about any other religious belief or ghosts or spirits or, or any of these other things, anything supernatural that, that we're pretty not interested in, like, Give us a shout and tell us why we should care and tell us what you believe and why. Um, and let's have an actual conversation about it because all too often uh, people think that these uh, things need to be kept private and quiet. And all that means is that we have a lot of people who don't know how to talk about these things and think about them detailed. Uh, so like that's where we're trying to fix that. We're trying to be here for you. With that, um, we have got... Oh, there we go. Um, we've got Richard calling in uh, from Arizona, pronouns he, him, uh, saying that he has a God belief that he is prepared to defend using the argument from technological singularity. That sounds very interesting. Richard, you are on AXP with Emma and Forrest. Hello, how are you today? Hi, Richard. I'm great. How are you guys? Hi, Emma. Uh, I'm a big fan of both of you. Aww. Well, thank you so much. Yay. Yeah, awesome. So tell us about what you're thinking here. Videos about the guy who's definitely not a, a doctor. And uh, Forrest, I recently watched your video about the conversation with Gramps, and I'm hopeful we can have a productive conversation. Most definitely. Yeah, yeah. Great. I love that. Okay, uh, so I'll tell you a couple of things about myself, uh, just so you kind of get a, a judge on me. You know, uh, in terms of morality, I believe that people can do whatever they want as long as they're not hurting someone else. I lack belief in any supernatural phenomena, ghosts and psychics and such. Uh, I believe the world is round and, four, you know, four billion years old. Uh, climate change is real. Evolution is real. Moon landing wasn't fake. Donald Trump is a criminal. Sovereign citizens uh, are deluded. Uh, and, yeah, the controversial belief that I have is that the technological singularity is coming and that it's basically going to be God. Okay. So, like, we really quickly... Before I started the show, I saw your call on the call screen. I Googled technological singularity to make sure I knew what we were talking about. And what I got mm -hmm. from that was that this is a, a hypothetical point at which technology becomes so uncontrolled and is developing, or rather, it's developing so rapidly and AI has gotten to a point where it's self-driven in such a way that it becomes just completely out of our control and the implications for humanity are unbeknownst to us and, and it, it's going to change everything fundamentally in every possible way and we have no idea what that's going to look like and it could be terrible and like is that we're talking about the same thing here that, that's yes that's exactly what it is a uh, related topic is accelerating change which is basically just the idea that technological growth itself is on an exponential growth curve and we're mm -hmm. basically at the point where you know if you have a chessboard and you put one and then two and then four and you know it gets the numbers get very very big and we're at that point now, pretty much. You know, we're we're just a few years out from from the singularity happening. Okay, so I agree that we are on an exponential growth curve. Um, the the way that you know technology, it's something something technological advancement doubles every X amount of years, and, and blah blah blah. I get, I agree with that. Um, I don't agree, or I I'm, I want to know more about where do you then say we are for sure 
a couple of years out from this hypothetical situation where that becomes uncontrollable? Where do you make that connection? Well, um, okay, uh, specifically, it was Ray Kurzweil who made the original predictions uh, in his book in the late 90s. Uh, it predicted a date uh, roughly by 2045. Uh, and he mm -hmm. updated that uh, in, I think it was like 2019 and said it was even more, you know, uh, within 10 years, he said then. And so I expect we're about five years out now. And, uh, you know, we are at the point where even futurists are not able to predict, you know, where we're going to be in five years because the technology is, I mean, the AIs are already almost, not not quite, but sure. at human level. But what 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 i'm i'm driving at is like if we know that that's a hypothetical thing if we know that that is a potential risk wouldn't it make sense that we would account for that and make a couldn't the technology get to a point where we make the technology that allows us to avoid this singularity of technology is that a thing the Jetsons was set in 2062 so like some guy several years ago said that by a few years from now we'll be at this place I don't believe that either. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's I, I'm not saying that it's impossible. And I think it sounds like a really cool story and it's definitely a cautionary tale that we should take seriously, but to put enough stock in it to actually be concerned about it, especially in such a short time frame, seems to me to be a little bit extreme. Well, it is extreme, but that's the nature of exponential growth curves. You know, they, they, they go out of control very quickly. And, and, uh, you kind of got me off track a little bit, but, uh, you know, I'll, 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 uh, the, the argument that I would make uh, is that, uh, you know, it, it, you said when you were talking to Gramps that, you know, that models are, they're never right, but that they can be useful. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with the uh, part of the nature of the singularity is that, you know, anything I propose is actually not crazy enough. We, you know, it's going to be wilder than that. Uh, but if we do imagine a world that, you know, has mature nanotechnology, and all, you know, the whole planet is blanketed in self-replicating nanomachines. They're all networked together with like 15G wireless and powered by a super intelligent AI. Then you have a being or group of beings that effectively on a planetary scale is everywhere, knows everything and can do anything. On a planetary scale. That meets like on a planetary scale. And also, when you say knows everything, knows everything that they have access to. And when you say can do anything, can do anything within the laws of physics on that planet that isn't outside of the capacity of what they can build by themselves. So, like, exactly. you are talking about a really cool, potentially doomsday scenario. But when you started this call, you said you're talking about, a, a, for lack of a better word, it seemed, a god. I don't know if you meant that word to be literal or if you meant it to be kind of metaphorical. I still think even that then is a bit of a stretch. You're still talking about in the worst case scenario of this situation, you're talking about one planet mm -hmm. and with one thing on it in a whole universe of nothing. So who cares? Well, well I call that a I God. Care. I mean, this is a, <laughs> I care. I mean, it's humans in general would care and uh, it's our planet. It affects us. You know, you, you care about climate. Yeah, but the word, the word God tends to That's also extend beyond just our planet and the purview of our interests. Mm, well, no, a, a lot of uh, uh, traditional God concepts are pretty much just about the planet. You know, uh, the, the, most of them don't deal with the universe that much. I mean, we only deal with what's within our perceptual range, you know, and that's that's on a planetary scale for, you know, 99.9% .9 of our experience. You're talking a little G God, just a, a thing that can do really well, cool stuff on a big scale. Well, I'm proposing the little G because I don't know what the limits are and I can't support the, you know, the, the big G, you know, the, the, with the exponential growth curve, perhaps it could go to a, you know, a universal scale and figure out some way to, you know, with quantum entanglement or something, you know, create copies of itself everywhere else, you know, but that's not something I can. Well, that's not, so, uh, sorry, that's not what quantum entanglement is, but also if I can, can I just dumb it? Cause I'm not the science one. I'm, just, I'm using that as a, 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 you know, just a concept. Sure. Uh, if I can just kind of dumb this idea down, and I'm not trying to do this in a rude way, I'm doing this for me as a, not a scientist. You're you're essentially worried about the Borg. It's it's we're becoming the Borg well, is is your concern. 
It sounds like that's a that's a potential path. That I mean, like I like I said, any model we actually propose is not accurate. So you know, it, it, the, because it's not it, crazy enough. Or it could be just just AI. You know, becomes nano machines everywhere and eliminates so, humanity. And if you if you don't mind, if I can like just rant for one second, I I have sure I have something of an issue, and I'm a big sci-fi fan, so I see this everywhere. Um, mm-hmm. AI is vastly, vastly overestimated right now, and I blame sensationalized news headlines and, uh, you know, how excited we get about the warfare between big tech companies. Really, the the kind of general AI that is popularized and controversial and a big topic at the moment is not, it could never reach the heights of the singularity. It really is just deriving predictions from human input you know i i think no, I, it's a cool idea but i don't think there's a lot of value in worrying about about us essentially becoming the borg because of the singularity in a few years if that's not too mean I, well it's basically inevitable from from what i understand of the scientific you know uh, the 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 progress of our technological advancement it's it's just going to happen. I mean it's uh, 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 um, and as far as the AIs currently go, are, are you are you current on on where the technology is right now? Because you know Claude three was just released and it's pretty impressive. Right, and I'm sure that it could be even scarier if it is it is. But like I I'm sure that it's scary and I'm sure it could be a lot scarier. I'm not convinced that it therefore is inevitably going to get to this crazy place where it takes over the planet and there's micro machines and, and nanobots and, yeah. and blah, blah, blah. Like it's, it's what, what you're doing is you're taking a thing, which at the very beginning of this call, I, I recited what I saw from the definition, which was that technology would get to a point where it becomes completely uncontrollable and unpredictable. And you said, yes, that's what you're talking about. And you're saying this point, which is so uncontrollable and unpredictable is going to happen in this way at this time. (laughs) And like, I just, I, you, you took a hypothetical concept about chaos and turned it into a doomsday prediction that you're damn near setting a date for. And so like, I, I agree that this is a scary concept, I don't agree that it's definitive or that it's inevitable or that it's going to play out exactly this way that that, you know, you can I you can make a logical progression of it and I can make a different logical progression of it. And we can both be great best selling science uh, sci fi writers and it'll be great. But like that's none of that is something to actually seriously concern yourself over if you're really worried about this stuff, like, for example, autonomous weapons, autonomous weapons aren't really an issue right now. And yet, like hundreds of scientists from all over the world have signed petitions demanding that we never make them never make autonomous weapons because we understand logically that could exist and we want to avoid that future so if we are talking about this this singularity where like ai gets out of control why not just say as we're approaching that point and we're realizing that a bunch of the tech guys all get together and they're like, yo, I, uh, this is something we need to be concerned about. So let's all agree not to make something smart enough to do that or to put a kill switch in it for when it does or for whatever other thing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's not realistic. I mean, the, the, technological advancement is going to happen. You can't prevent it. The only way, the only way that it doesn't happen is if civilization collapses first, you know that. And would, who's to say that that's not more likely? You're not going to stop. It is that I would, you know, estimate maybe it might even be a coin flip on whether we spiral out of control or or reach the singularity first. But you're not going to stop technological progress any more than you could stop someone from discovering the wheel. You know, it, it, it it's out there. It's it's it's. You, we're, we're not even inventing things. We're discovering properties of the universe, right? So what what do you propose, Richard? Is this is this a doomsday message to well, adopt nihilism and and just yeah, yeah. go out and live my crazy life before the singularity no, no, hits no, or no. we destroy ourselves? Or do you, do you, you have just a want, proposition? You just believe in technology because you want to sin. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to go out and live my life. <laughs> Sorry, Richard. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I do have some some epistemological conclusions. Uh, I think you would even agree with them. And that, the, you know, the, the best way to contribute to society is to 
be a scientist or an AI researcher or a science advocate uh, to to work in any field that supports society, whether you're a doctor or a nurse or an Uber driver, and to you know not do things that are going to make society collapse. Don't rob or steal or. So uh, all this is to say, you know, is, uh, we've got a ton of other callers I want to jump onto, but like, it's, it, I think the the long and short of this is like, I think you and I can both agree, Richard, that like, um, this is a scary and uh, terrifyingly not impossible scenario that you're talking about here. Um, however, I think the biggest disconnect that we're having is like, you seem a lot more sure that this is absolutely for sure going to happen. And I, I don't put any stock in that uh, as it is. Um, oh, and then it looks like Richard hung up. And so like, uh, we'll, we'll leave it there, I guess. <laughs> but, um, we've got a bunch of other cool stuff, uh, going on the show today. Um, Emma, do you have any final words before I move on or? No, just, uh, I, I like Isaac Asimov too. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> sometimes it feels a bit scary and depressing, but it is just a book and you can put it down. That's, that's kind of where I'm at with it is like, yeah, dude, we, we can all agree this is a scary situation. And the fact that it's not impossible sucks. Um, we're also yeah. not but I on agree a with, destiny course. I agree with Richard's conclusion that if it is all inevitable doom, we should just try and help people and be nice along the way. I think that For is sure. a fair conclusion. <laughs> yeah, no, that is that is a huge part of my own personal philosophy. So I, I agree with that as well. Um We've got a couple of announcements really quick. Number one, if you like what we do and you're, you're just you're sitting at home and you're like, man, I love AXP and I love Talk Heathen and I love Truth Wanted and I just wish that I could do more to help these people because they're so unbelievably cool and also Forrest is there. Uh, if, you're, if you're thinking these ways, as so many people are, uh, then you should consider supporting us on Patreon. Giving uh, to our Patreon ensures our ability to continue to produce the content that you love all the time. Uh, you can visit tiny.cc slash Patreon on AXP to learn more about that. You can also become a channel member for as little as 99 cents a month. Just click the join button right below this video, which will not only allow you to support us, but will also give you access to special chat emojis and early access to YouTube shorts and clips. I know everybody in this, you know, watching this video freaking loves emojis. Emojis are what we live for. Emojis are life. Uh, throw some of those emojis now into the chat so that people who aren't subscribed yet or aren't joined as channel members yet can see what they're missing and question their choices and, and what brought them here to this point in their life. And they can can fall down to their knees and, and confess with their mouths that AXP is the best uh, show for them to become uh, channel members for. Um, I, hate, I hate that phrasing, confess with your mouth. What, like what else am I gonna it's do? Creepy. With you? Con it's confess really creepy. with your ass. Uh, so weird. It's so. Weird. There's a dude who lives not too far. One of the houses not too far from me has that like on a large sign. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is like. What else am I gonna confess with? What? What's the point? I can't That's, read that any way other than disturbingly sexual. I mean, what? It, it feels really dirty. Um, Immediately, also, I'm picturing like a confession booth with like a glory hole. That's what. Yes, exactly. That's, That's just what precisely what it is. Yes. Come confess, child. Uh, the, the, we also have new limited edition merch. Check out our new T-shirts. Uh, I'm going to hell in every religion. I'll save you a spot. Uh, get your purchase in before it goes away at the end of the month because all these are limited edition. Um, and finally, I want to give a big thank you to the crew who makes this show possible before we move on to the next call. The crew put this show together every single week. Um, they're amazing. Look at them. Look at all those guys. They're great. Um, they're the ones who make this whole thing a reality. So if you love this show, then you got to love them too. Uh, and be sure to tell them about it as well. Um, we've got a bunch of other calls lined up and I'm going to jump on to Josh. Uh, for, we're not going to jump on to Josh, but I'm going to jump on to Josh's call. Uh, Josh, his pronouns are he, him. He's calling him from Texas, uh, who wants to share. This is interesting. He's listed as a theist here, but it says he wants to share a story of spiritual deconstruction um, um, and rejecting hell and accepting evolution and stuff. So, I'm interested to see Ooh. what Josh is talking about. Josh, you are on AXP. How are you today? Hi, guys. I, I am so nervous right now. This is my first time calling in. Uh, I'm talking to billions of people on the internet. It's, it's a little nerve wracking. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Uh, I do it every day and I'm terrible. So like, if I can get away with it, you can too. Yeah, I'm scared too, Josh. <laughs> don't worry. I <laughs> think <laughs> I absolutely love the both of you i love your youtube channels you've been very helpful to me um emma you are cool. hilarious and thoughtful uh i wanted to thank you for making me aware of the alex jones video game absolutely hilarious uh <laughs> that's a Sorry. thing <laughs> yeah, that's a thing <laughs> awesome of course for help 
Forrest, you, you're a really smart dude, and you've helped me understand evolution, so thank you. Um, okay, I, I'm, I'm glad I helped you understand evolution. I disagree that I'm a smart dude, but I appreciate that you like my videos. <laughs> Yeah, Noah's flood. When you you know when you think of a global flood, it doesn't make much sense. So that that was very helpful. Um, <laughs> I love off, making that video. First off, I want to talk about how I came to accept evolution. Uh, I started off as a young Earth creationist, uh, mm -hmm. pretty early on in life. I did some research on the age of the Earth. Uh, mm -hmm. My interpretation of the Bible was telling me one thing, and science was telling me another. That's, uh, that's when I discovered uh, GodAndScience.org. Uh, the site is defunct now, but it, it was a very helpful resource for me. Uh, it gave me the scientific evidence for an old earth and reasons why it was supported by Genesis. Um, the one piece of evidence that was overwhelming was distant starlight. Um, that pretty much proves an old universe. So I became an old earth creationist. Okay. That evolution still made no sense. Uh, I couldn't reconcile that with Genesis. Uh, and the website author didn't believe in evolution either. Um, but I will say one of the dominoes that started to fall was the Ken Ham Bill Nye debate. And oh. the was when Ken Ham said, nothing can change my mind. One of the things that Christianity teaches is humility. And I was able to recognize that is not humility, that is arrogance. This was highly disturbing. I, I realized I did not want to be like this guy, to have a closed mind. Um, and I, I would hear things about evolution and be like, oh, that kind of makes sense, but I, don't, I just don't think it's true. Um, the thing that got me thinking about uh, why I was rejecting it, all these scientists and all these fields are coming to the conclusion that evolution happens. How could all these people be wrong? Are, are they lying? Are they spent their lives studying the subject. Am I smarter than all of them? <laughs> so I was able to defer to the scientists about so many things, and including the age of the Earth, and why should evolution be any different? Um, I think the thing that finally set me over the edge was the DNA evidence. Uh, all life is genetically related. The second chromosome mm -hmm. in humans is the fused chromosome to eight chromosomes. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess the final nail in the coffin was retroviruses. Uh, retroviruses embed themselves in DNA. They become more closely related. Uh, the more closely related you are to another species, the more retroviruses you share in common with that species. Um, th this was stone cold proof that special creation, all animals and humans are separate creations, was just not true. And so I finally just embraced reality. And uh, yeah, and now I would say that Genesis one and two are they have to be poetic. They can't they can't be literal. So, so this all sounds fantastic. I'm, I'm really happy to hear your, your, your story and, and, and to hear these things. Um, you know, they're, they're, this is what happens a lot. A lot of stories that we hear from people who have deconstructed are, I was looking for reasons to believe in a God and I, it turns out I couldn't find any. Or I was looking for evidence against evolution and it turns out I found a lot of evidence for it. Or I was looking for evidence of, for a young earth and all I could find was old earth evidence. And like things like this happen a lot. Um, but it says here on the call screen that you're still a theist. So, like, I don't think that it's necessary. It, it, it doesn't make any sense to say, well, here's all this science, therefore there is no God. But I'm curious to know where you are in your journey now to where you've been able to tear down all of these beliefs. And it sounds like you're still stuck with, okay, yeah, I understand, you know, this is the age of the earth. This is how planets form. This is how life starts. This is how life evolves. Here's all these things. But also there's a God on top of it. So like, could you explain where you're at with that with me? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I've watched too many of atheist experience clips and uh, you forced to, to know that, to try to prove that, that, that the Bible is true, that God exists. Like I, I every argument I ever heard for my position, I've heard a, a better argument against it. So like, okay. I don't know. I think I'm just kind of holding this hope of like there is a god and um and that you know there's there's a good uh, you know life after this life uh, that's something fundamental that i've had all, all my life um so i'm sure if i i'm sure you would both agree if i continue down this path i i may become more either agnostic or atheist but um mm -hmm. I'm just, that's just not where i am right right now okay so like 
that's better than nothing. But I, I, I gotta ask, like, when you say, like, what what you just said is every single argument I have for God, I have heard a better argument for not believing. How then? You answered the question when you said, you know, there. Well, I still have some sort of hope. I'm. I guess my issue is for me. I I don't have that hope. I I hope that there isn't such a thing because such a thing sounds awful to me. And I'm. You said you've heard me talk about this, so I won't bore you with it. But like, where where does that hope get you? Why do you have it? Why is it important to you? You know, what is it doing for you? Um, is it something that you're willing to part with? Is it something that you would part with? Can you explain when you would and like what would get that away from you? I'm not trying to say this is you know, the show we're here to dash your hopes, but like I think life is a lot better without that one particular one. I think that hope is a prison, um, and and it's not really a it, it, it it's a bastardization of how wonderful the word hope usually is. So, would you be amicable to exploring that a little bit further with Emma and I? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> I, I feel like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have a big, I have a huge community around me of Christians that I love and respect. And I, I have one good Christian friend who's much more progressive and would agree with a lot of things I just said. And I, and I had plans about talking about my deconstruction on hell. And I think he agrees with that as well. Um, oh. It's, I, I think the community in a sense has helped me. Um, and I, as I was, I was going to mention this in my second part, but, uh, I've had some, you know, tragic things in my life that has, you know, got me through it. And I just don't mm. see how, if I were an atheist or agnostic, how I would have that same hope. Yeah. You did. That's very common. You have been robbed of the opportunity to develop healthy coping mechanisms because religion tried to fill a void that it wasn't allowed. It shouldn't have been allowed to fill that I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. Um, and that's one of the damnable miseries of deconstruction is that now you have to go back and learn how to deal with having a shitty day um, in a new way, how to lose a family member and, and not lose your mind along with it, um, how to handle trauma and pain and suffering and misery and the, the drudgery of day-to-day -day life without some thought that everything is going to be okay as soon as you die. Um, I think that would be where I, I'm happy to talk about some of my ideas with you if you'd like, but like, it sounds to me like that's where you need to be focusing your attention is like, okay, now how do I live without God? How do I get by without religion? And if this God's real and this really, and it's all, and the faith is a cool thing, fine. It can sit there in the background while I live my life. But at the very least, taking the time to develop the skills to, to deal with life on your own and building the strength up to, to just exist in this world by yourself. I think that's a noble and worthy endeavor for anybody, regardless of whether or not a God is real. Do you agree with that? Or do you think that you need to maintain this crutch for as long as you live? I mean, the crutch is certainly helping <laughs> as crutches do. But it'd be a lot better to be able to to get by on your own, yeah. Maybe. Uh, do I have time to go into my second part, or do you need to move on? I want to see if Emma has anything to say before we do. Oh, I'd just say this isn't the place for me or Forrest to say abandon your community, <laughs> join our side. <laughs> we have cookies. Um, I I completely understand where you're coming from. If you continue to explore. I think that that you, this isn't, nobody is saying abandon all your beliefs overnight. I do think, especially once you start getting interested in science and how that works with and sometimes against the Bible, um, the historicity of the Bible is something that I really love digging into. I think it's really fascinating. That process can lead you towards a more secular path, but thanks to things like AXP and the ACA and stuff like that, you can build yourself a community outside of that. And having an expanded support network that isn't just within your religious community is a good thing anyway. So my advice would just be also expand those horizons. You don't have to do that with the view to abandoning your community. It's just a benefit anyway. 
that would be how I would sort of move on from there. Because it sounds like you've got a very open mind. You're interested in learning. I would just keep the momentum up because that's great. Whatever you, if you carry on doing that as a Christian, that's brilliant too. Just keep going. Thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll move on to the, the hell part. Um, I supposedly got saved at five. I prayed the prayer. Um, grew up with the traditional view of most people go to hell. Some people go to heaven. Hell is a very real place. Uh, I didn't know at the time, but the term was uh, conscial, eternal conscious torment. And in care. Pastor who's talking about Matthew 7, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, into the kingdom of heaven. And I was terrified because my prayer I prayed when I was five was no longer valid. And then about four years later, we had a family tragedy. My, my brother committed suicide. Um, we had the funeral, and it was made very clear that he prayed the salvation prayer. But um, So he's in heaven, right? But I, I couldn't stop thinking about Matthew 7, and what if his prayer was not genuine? And I discovered Bill Weiss, the guy who wrote 23 Minutes in Hell. Uh, hell right. It's the worst possible thing to imagine. Literal fire, demons ripping you to shreds. Uh, no oxygen to breathe, no food or water forever. And um, me not thinking much, this was kind of proof for me that ECT was real, eternal conscious torment. And I was like, if my brother is experiencing this now, never ending pain and suffering, nothing I can do about it. No matter how hard I pray, you'll never experience relief. This was pretty torturous for me. Uh, completely ate away at me. There, there was, if there ever was a chance to save him, it was far too late now. And then I, I started like questioning some of his theological things. He said like a really small theological thing that was different than what I believed, having to do with like sickness and where it comes from. Um, and I was like, I started asking more questions, and I'm like, um, is it, is this guy really telling the truth? And, and one of those quite new questions was, uh, how can a Christian be happy in heaven, knowing a lot of their friends, family, and loved ones? are suffering forever. Uh, why wouldn't all loving God torture people endlessly? Uh, why are you completely saleable before death, but the second you die, God stops loving you? Um, mm -hmm. And I just came to the conclusion that an all-loving God and eternal separation or eternal conscious torment is just incompatible. Um, if he desires all to be saved, um, I, I, honestly, I think when it comes down to it, hell is a manipulation tactic to keep people from leaving the faith, keep them in those seats on Sunday, keep the tide money coming in. Um, and I've heard tragic stories of atheists who don't believe in God, heaven, hell, um, yet they still have nightmares and haunting thoughts over the hell concept. And I've, I've had the exact same experience. And I, I think mainstream Christianity is doing so much damage to people with this idea of hell. And I, I hope we as Christians could rethink this doctrine. Um, and I so think... Actually, one sorry, Josh, you finish up. Days, I, I was the Christians out there and be like, maybe, maybe kind of try to think about this for yourself and so instead of just pointing to Bible verses and being like, that's it, you know, like, does this, does hell really, is, is it, a, is a loving God and, and the nature of hell, is, is that really compatible? So that's, I find that really interesting, Josh, because that's one of the fundamental problems I have with Christianity. One of the absolute stumbling blocks, walls between myself and Christianity has always been how can anyone be comfortable with the concept of heaven and hell? I would never ever, I would, if I had the option, if it was real and I got to the gates of heaven, I would say no thank you because <laughs> good people or, you know, people of whatever, I guess at that point we have to define goodness, whatever, there are people suffering eternally. I am not comfortable with eternal peace, joy, whatever, while that exists. I'm interested that you have found that a moral stumbling block and come to the conclusion that an all-loving God, which I completely agree with, couldn't do those things. But there's a biblical precedent for that. So my question is kind of, and it's, I guess it ties into your, your reading of Genesis as well. How, how are you understanding some of the Bible as the, the manipulative church, manipulative priests, some of the Bible as poetic? How, how are you defining what is, is your sort of real faith, as it were? 
like how do I reconcile my universalist beliefs with hellfire uh, in the Bible? Yeah, what, what, when you pick up the Bible, how do you know what is real and what is not? Because the, the concept of hell is, is a biblical concept based on what is in the canon. The longer I live, the more I come to realize there's, uh, you take any number of Christians who look at a Bible verse and you'll come up with a million different answers as to what it means. And uh, the, I've heard things of uh, eternal as being mistranslated. It doesn't mean forever. It means for an age. I've heard fire is not uh, like a torturous fire. It's like a fire of refinement, like, you, you know, make gold pure, that kind of thing. Stick sure. your hand I in find a, that, a forge and I, tell me that's not torturous <laughs> fire. Like, what's the I find difference? it a little bit of a stretch and still not okay. If it was actually an age, if the fire isn't that bad, it's still not okay for me. And my question is still the same. How do you decide that that translation is the correct one? And then are you planning to go through the whole Bible that way? Because that's sort of what I would recommend for the position you're in, is to go through the Bible and say, okay, what is... Yeah. If, if some of this is metaphorical, if some of this cannot be morally acceptable what in this text is real and i wonder if it's worth it's worth it's worth exploring not what you just find objectionable morally that you remember from the bible but going through the whole of your faith because you've sort of acknowledged that some of your your faith beliefs are contradictory with what you hold morally and logically yeah like i said i i, I may be transitioning to another point uh maybe closer to a Atheism, but I, I don't see that now, but I'm certainly not going to count it out. Um, and like I said, with my, one of my friends I mentioned earlier, he he has the view that it's possible that Moses wasn't even a real person. So, I mean, there's lots of Christians out there with so many um, and, and yeah, and for a lot of Christians, it's, the Bible is, they, they have to accept it, or at least their interpretation of it has to be right. And so, well, the Bible says like a fire, so I guess that's reality. Well, yeah, I mean, it's that or, or Catholic dogma or, you know, the Quran. So <laughs> it's, it, it's you kind of the based on how the religion works, you kind of have to take the whole or or you, you do a deep dive into the historicity of every book, which I think is the most interesting way of doing it, but I'm not your boss. <laughs> A lot of Christians I talk to, they're like, you know, God is bigger than all of our systems. And if that's true, then it's very likely that God can be found um, through other ways than just showing up at a Southern Baptist church and accepting their interpretation of the Bible. Uh, I mean, sure, but like, what a jerk to play hide and yeah. seek for so long so <laughs> thoroughly like that i don't know man it, why did it he make the me... why did he make the te the text changeable why did he yeah. put such a fallible uh, uh way of understanding him and what he why wants us to do down on the down earth if he could do anything he could go back to freaking bronze age palestine and invent an ipad and and record a little youtube video for us and like you know it's, i'm just saying like it's to me it, it, it sounds like you're on your way. It sounds like you're on the journey now of, of progressive deconstruction and picking apart these beliefs. And it sounds like there's still some things you're holding on to, probably partially because of fear, because of what you already said, the comfort and the hope of it. Um, but the more that you answer Emma's questions, the more I think to me, at least, hopefully to you as well, it's becoming more and more clear that like, really, there is no utility to, to what you're saying. There's there's no nothing that you're saying is is like, OK, I can use this framework. I can use this model and I can find out what's true. It's just this doesn't feel good. but This does. So I'm going to rip these pages out of the book and say the book is perfect again. Um, and like that to me is something that I I hope and this may sound incredibly condescending and I really don't mean it to. So forgive me if it does. It sounds to me like something that you're going to look back on in six months and be like, ah, oh, fuck. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I, you know what I mean? Like you're, you'll be able to kind of de from all the progress you've said you've made so far of like, I, I'm definitely believe in young earth. And then you listen to a reasonable debate about it and like, okay, well, I guess that doesn't work. And I definitely don't believe in evolution. And then you read up on it and like, okay, well, I guess that makes sense. And then you, you hell hits you and you're like, all right, but like, actually my morality doesn't allow me to accept that or to think that's okay. So therefore I'm going to change my belief system again. It sounds to me like you're on the way at this point. 
where in a few months time, you'll be able to say, all right, this whole thing, when I apply the same rules of logic and morality to this belief system, as I do to literally anything else ever, it falls apart. And therefore, I'm not going to waste my life trying to hold up a sandcastle. I'm just going to let it crumble. And I'm going to go do something more meaningful with my time, with my brain power, with my heart. Um, I'm going to go do something that makes me happy and I'm going to go make the world a little bit better. And I'm going to make sure everybody's like the first caller said, you know, like if I know I'm going to die anyway, I'm going to be as little of a dick as possible. And I'm going to try to make as many people smile as I can before I go. And that to me sounds like a much better way to live than trapped by the shackles of, of the fear of the potential maybe monster in the sky that you've already reasoned your way halfway out of. Yeah. Yeah, and, and if we were con to continue this conversation, uh, and I think you already have, you can, you can you can definitely run circles around me because I, I've I've listened to too much AXP and Forrest Salkai to know that um, <laughs> uh, that you're not going to argue uh, you're not going to argue the Bible and and God's existence. So, no, not not in a fun way. <laughs> but anyway, that's the. Uh, Josh, that's about 20 minutes and we got to move on to the next call. Um, but I really appreciate you sharing your story with us. And, and yeah, I it's really, nice to hear. I, I have the utmost hope for you because you sound like a really smart guy and you sound like a guy who's able to like parse some things apart and see what you believe in why and not just I believe it. So I believe it. So I believe it. Um, and I encourage you to call back next time, either Emma or I are on, give us an update, you know, let us know how you're doing. Um, keep in touch Hi. and, 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 Hopefully someday you call in, it won't have a T next to your name, it'll have an A next to your name, and we can all celebrate. <laughs> Come to the dark side. Honor and privilege. I, re I really appreciate you. I, I love you guys. Uh, thank you so much for letting me uh, get my little story there. Cool, my pleasure, man. You, Thanks so much for calling in. Talk to you later. All right. What a nice dude. Uh, we've got just an absolute shit ton of Super Chats. Uh, so I'm going to read some of them. We're going to go through some of these super chats really quick. We've got uh, before the show even began, uh, we had Jonathan France uh, who sent in five dollars to say, apparently you can super chat weeks in advance. Today is the 29th of February. Emma can do an amazing American accent. Looking forward to this. Love you. Bye. Can you do an amazing American accent? For a British audience. My general American, which is not a real accent, is passable. Mm -hmm. When I'm in the room with an American. <laughs> do it, 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 do it. Wide and right at the back. I I can do a passable general American if I'm on stage in front of a British audience. It's okay, but I need to work on it. <laughs> that wasn't bad. That was that was pretty good. I haven't warmed that it up. Yeah, yeah it's, I, it needs a warm up. That's you know, it, that's a thing. If I heard that in my day to day, I'd be like, okay, maybe her parents are are from somewhere else, and she's kind of like just just dealing with you know, what I mean, maybe she's like mm. you know, something like that's from that's, all that's, over. That was, that was great. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Do the rest of the show with that. Uh, we've got uh, Alan um, uh, sent in some. I don't know how to read this, but it said <laughs> Isaiah Isaiah S $5. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's Alan Isaiah. I don't know. Maybe someone named Alan posted that, and I'm really stupid. Isaiah S. sent $5. That's what it is. <laughs> That's what it is. Um, could a mustard seed? Oh, it said that on the first one, too. It's just over to the side. <laughs> Nobody watched the last 10 seconds of this show. Go erase Go that back from your mind. And erase that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shame over. Um, <laughs> Isaiah S. sent $5. Could a mustard seed of faith bury alive the god of the gaps? Supposedly, it can do anything. You can move mountains. Uh, Miranda Rensberger, who was a member for two months, sent uh, $5. Hooray! Two of my favorite YouTubers, uh, Emma Stone and Jeremy. <laughs> that's a callback <laughs> to the last time I was on and and the, an inside joke for you. That's that's some deep lore. That's some deep that's lore deep. for Zane's That show. cuts deep. Mm. Uh Thomas Gallipoli sent $2. Thank you, Emma and AMP, AXP, maybe Forrest. You two are the best. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you. Ampersand code. You can ignore that. Is that it what that is? is? <laughs> yeah. Oh, all right. See, I'm learning, how to, 
I'm <laughs> I'm incredibly stupid. Um, we've got Ruben Manzo sent uh, five A A five dollars. Is it Australian dollars? Is it Albanian dollars? Is it Armenian dollars? Ruben Manzo sent five ass dollars. A uh, shortened for a uh, version is just silliosis. Um, uh, silicon in the lungs. Hey, I was right. Silicon in the mm. lungs. Miranda Rensberger um, sent another $50. Good gravy, y'all. I said I would increase my super chat if Forrest said that word. Unlike Jesus, I keep my promises. What <laughs> word did I say? I'll what say did you it say? again. It was worth $50. Uh, monkey at typewriter. Oh, here. Uh, JT sent $10 with no message. Thank you very much. Uh, monkey at typewriter sent $5. Wait, oh, don't, don't scroll when you, a new thing is posted. There we go. Uh, wait, so if the glaciers melt, uh, will North America teeter back? Basically, I'm asking, is there a silver lining to climate change? Hashtag sink Florida for the Republic. <laughs> no, unfortunately, <laughs> the space beneath Florida has already filled in. Uh, and also, we are well past the last glacier maximum to a point where it wouldn't matter anymore. If it was going to change it would have changed by now x million unless you can get some glaciers in florida find a way to fight climate change enough that we get fl just florida very cold we'll make it work we'll find a way <laughs> um x million sent ten dollars crucified sent to hell and all i got was a totally free uh to my uh, sorry all i got was totally free to be myself without any impetus guilt tripping judgment uh uh but what is the question for next week flip i didn't read the question for next week <laughs> god damn it yeah i knew i was reading something i'm so bad at my job you guys I forget. are you okay I forget. today no uh, what's it? the the good news is is that none of this is atypical this is just how bad i am at this all the time i am never good at this show i forget it's not just me that's okay then no i just damn it um they're gonna fire they're gonna fire me somebody whoever's in charge fire fire for us guy. um the prompt for this week thank you so much for tuning in hi welcome to the beginning of AXP. I'm, <laughs> I'm your host, Forrest Falkai. Uh, the prompt for this week is, what was Jesus doing in his teens? Wrong answers only. Who wasn't Jesus doing in his teens is the real question. You know what I mean? The, the guy was all over the place. Emma, what do you think? What was Jesus doing in his teens? Wrong answer. Well, I've I've heard he was hung, so um, I think he was probably... There's no reason to assume his uh, plans changed, so I assume <laughs> he was putting his face on toasted bread still but in those days it would have taken way longer he was like using carpenter's tools to chisel his face yeah, yeah. into a loaf of bread nobody knew it's who like he was the... it was really awkward he's like guys this is gonna catch on trust me i love it i love it new use for the hand holes uh we've got <laughs> uh a florida for for like polishing carpentry is what it is what did you think i was talking about um, i just i just hate the hand holes it's you trying to eat M&Ms like this. <laughs> I mean, just, uh, it's awful. Florian Schmidt um, sent uh, five euros and 99 euro parts. Um, uh, I've been thinking, do I celebrate Christian holidays with my imaginary kid when I'm trying to raise them secular? If so, how to talk about them? I celebrate Christmas uh, Christmas. It, 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 with myself and my equally anti-theist wife, we, we do Christmas and we just, we give each other presents and we spend time with our families and we hang out and we sing songs and we uh, decorate a tree's corpse for fun. Uh, uh, we do all the things. Um, we just don't, just completely not to do with Jesus. Um, yeah, I and, mean, they're going to pick up the religion question from school or friends or clubs. Yeah. Like, it'll come up at some point and you just gently explain it to them, I don't think. I mean, if you're yeah. if you're looking for legit like hardcore advice, uh, mm. my partner and I decorate a black Christmas tree and use like fake chains instead of tinsel, so that's always Radical. an option. Metal, love it. Uh, the the yeah, it's, it's the same thing as if if the kid came home and said, "Hey, my my buddy at school uh, was talking about Ramadan. What's that?" And you explain, well, some people believe this, and this is how they do it, and this is what they think. If if you're talking about why are there you know colorful trees everywhere? Well, here's the here's the this is what people do. And okay, well, why are they talking about this guy, this Jesus guy? Well, here's what some people believe. Same way you would handle anything else. I don't think it needs to be as 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 scary of a conversation as you might think. Um, and I think just like with so many other things, if you make it a big serious conversation, that will then actually create the problem rather than just this is what it is, no big deal, and then move on with your day. Um, and we can talk about why it's a problem later. <laughs> um, 
We got uh, JT sent 999. Elon complains about AI depicting the founding fathers as black because it's woke. But Grok, is that actually what's called? His AI uh, won't answer if an omniscient God makes free will impossible only. I, I haven't heard about any of that. Um, I am 0% surprised that that dude has a stupid ass opinion and a broken system that he thinks is cooler than it is. None of that is, that's all par for the course. The good news is that Grok is the main character of uh, an alligator themed detective adventure game. So that sounds radical. You can that always look like that a instead. Better, that's a better thing to do. Uh, then mm -hmm. it, it, you can either play that game or give half a shit about anything that Elon Musk ever says or does. The, the game is better. Um, Good game. Mustafa Jav, um, cool name, uh, sent $4.99. Uh, the algorithm, I guess you made algorithm. Maybe they've typed it wrong. The algorithm made me discover your channels independently last week. Tell Spooky. me there isn't a god. Um, Love the content from both of you, other than the scarf obsession in movies. That was, I loved making that video, dude. Uh, I still have the scarf. Um, go check out my video about a matter of faith if you want to be in on the scarf inside jokes. Um, Ruben Manzo uh, sent five ass dollars. Let's not make something smart enough uh, to overthrow us. Sounds like Forrest just described God. That is, you know what, though? The whole Tower of Babel story there they won't be able to there's nothing they won't be able to accomplish if they can all speak to each other so let's jumble up their language slave masters and union busters do the same thing um oh yeah dragon fairy who's a member of two months uh disappeared from my screen just then because another thing was posted uh flip dude hold on wait Wait, wait, we're on a new system, y'all. Uh, Dragon Fairy, who's a member for two months, sent $5. Hi, Emma and Forrest. Hi. Um, two of my favorite people ever. I'd love for both of you to respond to this. How does one refute people justifying the Bible? And then some letters and symbols, and I'm assuming means that there was an emoji here, but I don't know if that's what happened. So I'm just going to say that they ended this with how does one refute people justifying the Bible? Ambersand LT semicolon three, which uh, that is pronounced uh, Greg. Uh, how does someone refuse people justifying the Bible, Greg? I don't know. Don't call me Greg. Um, I would say... Uh, uh, Emma, you, you go. You tell me. It, d it depends which part of the Bible. It completely yeah. depends. It's an anthology of books that contain loads of different things. You can't really refute the whole Bible with like a word. Yeah. It's, Unless it's, it's Greg, yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, type type that and somebody will, will become Satanist. Um, it's uh, uh, honestly, it's someone trying to say like, it's so, someone trying to justify the Bible, um, I would say you just pull out all the unjustifiable parts of the Bible. God killing Jephthah's daughter, um, the the calls for genocide, the 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 excusing of slavery and, and giving rules for it, um, putting a death penalty on working on a Sunday. Uh, it was these things that like just have absolutely no way for you to say, well, this is good because, um, you know, if 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 you have a book that explains how to sell your daughter into sex slavery and what to pay for her maybe get a better fucking book, you know, like that's, I'm, I'm sorry, but like, it's, it, it, I, I don't, I'm not, not into that. Um, we got, uh, Oh, flip dude. That was from dragon fairy. And then the next one is from Nero, the fairy queen. Neat. Um, so a member of two months, they sent $5. I think it's more likely we get cyborgs before androids. Um, fusing human technology cyborgs. is more and more complicated every year. Yeah. Don't we? Yeah, we got cyborgs. People have got pacemakers and uh, you know arms. <laughs> What's uh, the word I'm arms. trying to look for? Arms, <laughs> prosthetics. No, it's arms. It's Pros the arm. modern prosthetics. <laughs> yeah, of arms I, and things. <laughs> I was yeah, I, I was thinking about it because like the whole cyborg thing that was a big part of like my first master's we were talking about. So, so uh, the first master I did was in biological anthropology, and we're sort of focusing on human evolution. Um, and a big part of that story is tool making, is stone tools. Um, and I made an argument, I wrote a paper um, for, for that once where I made the case that like humans are by nature cyborgs, that like this technology is a part of what it means to be a human. There's even some evidence that there's a genetic link to it. And so like 
we are cyborgs by nature because we are literally mm. evolving with technology, making technology, and that technology has shaped our evolution. So like we made tools and tools made us in return. The, the, the fusion of biology and technology literally happened when the first monkey hit a rock against another rock and made and then was able to crack open some bones. It's just cool things to think about it, yo. Um, we've got aggressive blip, uh, $5. God is love, not a powerful sky daddy, but the hope, the possibility for human empathy and kindness. That way God can be everywhere and within us. No, thanks. <laughs> those, those, those are all things it's just one I, of those I, semantic things where i have arbitrarily decided to call this concept god okay if, if, i don't call that god if, if this person is being sincere thank you for sending five dollars i disagree with the use of the term if you are a fan and you're sending this to, to just put this in front of us as like an argument or a a, a, a thing yeah and no, i i also see that silly and maybe you are an atheist and you're you're trying to bridge a gap and you're you're in that that phase of like religion isn't necessarily bad it's just wrong and there's a beautiful bridge to be built here uh, i disagree with that too but i like just take the god section out of it and the whole like hope and empathy and kindness being all permeating and, and, and connecting and uniting humanity. Those are all really nice things. Um, uh, me and percent my human. That's what that says. Me ampersand a M P semicolon. My human is what I'm seeing. It probably just is me and my human. <laughs> Why wouldn't it just use the, the ampersand is in the dumb text code. Uh, 1999. Formatting. Thank you, Emma. Format it better. Thank you, Emma, Forrest, and the crew. And then it has emojis. It has a thumb up and a heart that what? I can see. Why now is I'm it confused. this way? Why is it this way? Thank you so much for the $20. I'll eat every one of those dollars. Uh, uh, Johan uh, Sundell sent 20. I'm guessing those are Swedish kroner. That or they're just... Uh, 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 Sibley Ethiopian crocodiles with a K. $20. Yeah. Is there still a crew cat? That's a question for the crew. I believe. Uh, uh, do, they, do we have a crew cat that we can put on screen? If there is, it'll be up soon. While I read the next one, um, which is um quantum answer uh gifted 10 atheist experience memberships and they nice. themselves have been a member for two years good gravy y'all thank you so much quantum answer um and then we've got is it uh the symbol what oh okay uh nick's member nyx member uh sent 40 rupees uh which is a symbol Just that Nick's. i can actually see Nick's uh, just, has been oh. a member for six months. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. You're right. You're right. No, that is Nick's what it member, is. Six yeah. months old. <laughs> Change your <laughs> six months old. <laughs> uh, Very said, eloquent. Baby. I love that. <laughs> Coming out as gender fluid. Love both of Yay. you. Congratulations on Congrats. discovering more about yourself and coming out to the world and telling people who you are. That's awesome. Um, yeah, Johan Sundell sent another 20 Swedish dollars. Um, so sad to hear about the cat. Um, I, I guess there isn't a cat. Who knew? Um, um. Scotty uh, sent 99 cents uh, just for the sake of doing it. Thank you very much. Um, we got. All, I told you, so many super chats. Th this is all one word. AJ Canada pictures, all one word, all in caps. No caps. Ban this person. Um, sent four ninety nine. Um, uh, new show idea below deck. Noah, <laughs> what got on on that boat? You know what I'm saying? Where where were people relieving themselves on that boat? Also, mm. did the, the when they flooded the whole damn world? Did the aquatic animals survive that? Did they have big tanks on the boat? Did they have like an aquarium section of the boat where they put squids and shit? Well, or did I don't they just... understand how the birds all survived. Everyone yeah. I've heard discuss it says all the birds survived, but has right. never explained how. And when even, the whole if world that is flooded. the case, then why the fuck did the birds get to escape judgment, but giraffes didn't? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like what what the fuck did the did the did kangaroos do to needed to be wiped off the face of the fucking planet, except for two of them? But so meanwhile. Rude whales live in their best lives just the whole world is now a new place to swim weird phytoplankton y'all i'm curious about microorganisms during the flood uh we got 
Gorp Trio is the, what that says. Six dollars and sixty-six cents. Uh, Jeremy and Emma Stone are my favorite ACA show hosts. Sorry, Ahmed. Uh, join us for a meet in the ACA Tuesday nights on the ACD. Uh, Gregory from Tennessee. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I'm loving. I, I'm sticking with Jeremy, dude. I'm, I'm going to call Armin Ahmed until the day he dies. Um, uh, then we've got a Lenny sent six euros and 66 euro parts. Um, uh, what is the dumbest animal and why is it the greater Rhea? Y'all, if there is any evidence that evolution isn't real, it's freaking Rhea's. I have never seen a stupider animal in my life. They are insane. Go meet one before you snark at me. Go meet one and tell me it's not dumb as a bag of hammers. Um, that thing would it uh, my god that's what that is <laughs> definitely um, yeah, couldn't be five, anything else no five theoretical dollars um i was in the same boat as josh there for about two or three years ago but both emma and forest videos helped me uh figure things out for myself atheist now that's very kind of Aww. you thank you so much congratulations on your deconstruction i'm honored to have been a part of it um wild underscore lee coyote sent 499 i subscribe to both uh, of you and i subscribe to both of you on your regular channels keep up the good work and bringing logic to the theists thank you so much we do our best um and then <laughs> there is a message from the producers <laughs> saying hey don't take a break from reading super chats which they surely <laughs> sent like five minutes ago and that's the show <laughs> So, <laughs> tune in next week to watch me be really freaking bad at my job some more. Um, we took a chat poll a little while ago, and we asked oh. you guys uh, what kind of calls you wanted to hear next. Um, and thirty-two uh, percent uh, of you, and from the poll there, that which the, the the winning one said you wanted to call about evolution, and so we've got one. Um, we had a couple, and I'm just going to scroll a little bit, see if that other guy's still here, and it looks like he is not. Um, but we've got this person, uh, Tyler, pronouns he, him, calling him Colorado, says the first six days of creation in Genesis lines up with evolution pretty well, and they don't think that they could have, we could have known that when Genesis was written. Boy, do we have some things to talk about. Tyler, you are on AXP. How are you doing today? Pretty good. So just to be clear, um, you're, you're, from what I'm hearing here, you're a theist and you believe that the Bible adequately explains in some way how actually life is diversified and therefore that's evidence for the Bible being true. Is that where I'm getting or like what I'm understanding here? Kind of. That is just one sticking point that I have here. Um, okay. I've been on the fence for about three years now. <laughs> but uh, okay. still living in a very Christian household, it's kind of hard to get away from that. Yeah, so let's talk about it then. Um, I've got my Bibli right here, and uh, I'm looking at Genesis. So how do you think that... Are we doing, the, just quickly, are we doing Genesis 1 or 2? That was going to be my first question. the order of creation is a little bit different. Yeah, that's that always gonna, my that, first question. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, so where are we at, Tyler? Uh, in Genesis 1. Okay. It's, it like... It roughly is like it roughly explains our current theory of the Big Bang and evolution. It says there was light, then there was planets, then there was um, Hello? Did we lose you? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. Sorry. Um so I, far away. I just want to make sure I'm looking at the right one. Um, because yeah, Genesis one here is, yes, we have light first and then we have the earth after that. And then we have plants. Okay. Um, right. Am I, am I missing one? Yeah. So we have the, the light, light first and God makes day and night. Um, and then yeah. later he makes the sun and the moon afterwards, way afterwards, like way afterwards. Uh, so he makes he makes light and he makes a day and night cycle. Then after that, yeah. he makes uh, a firmament from the water. So he, I guess he makes the sky there. Um, 
And then he makes plants. Um, he makes the difference between water and land, and then he makes uh, plants. Yeah. I picked the wrong so I, one. Uh, I didn't really. Are we doing Genesis 2? I, I forgot. Yeah, it was 2. I forgot. Okay. So, different one. We've got here. Uh, let's see here. Genesis 2. Where do we start on that one? So Genesis 2 is the one where, if I remember correctly, I'm, I'm looking for it right now. Yes, out of the ground, God made every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and then brought them to Adam and, and Adam named them, right? Yeah. So let's talk about that. How do we get animals out of the ground? How does that account for evolution? Because in Genesis 1, he makes all of the animals out of the water, which would sound an awful lot a lot like more like how evolution actually works. So in Genesis 2, he makes them out of dirt. How does that track? Yeah. It it's more like not it it was just the rough around the edges like it sounds similar, but I'm just I'm really just confused on it, honestly. What's there to be confused about? It says here, out of the ground, the Lord made the Lord God formed every yeah, beast yeah. of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them to Adam. And Adam gave names to the cattle and the fowl and the blah, blah, blah. And then Adam, he put Adam to sleep and took one of his ribs and made a woman out of it. So it's pretty cut and dry. He formed Adam out of dust and then he formed the rest of the animals out of dust. And you're saying that sounds an awful lot like how evolution works. And I don't get how. I'm saying it's like... It's more, honestly, like, I'm trying to find the words here, but what is it? Like, I got really nothing here, so thanks for clarifying that. Sure. Anything else we can do for you? Yeah. Not really. That's just helpful with, like, trying to explain to my parents about why I'm starting to drift away from the religion that they grew up with and they put me through as a child. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, look, dude, there. like it just, uh, have you read this? Like, have you been through the Bible yourself and, and, and read what it says? Yes. I've been through it several times and that is one of the there reasons you go. why I don't like being a Christian. Yeah. So like, that's, that's the whole thing is like, that's if your parents are telling you like, Hey, this makes sense do exactly what we just did for the last five minutes and just read it. And I'm like, all right, so here's what you're saying. Yeah. Um, let's check and see if that yeah. you go back to Genesis one, which is the, you know, we, I know you said you weren't calling in about that one after all, but Genesis one, he makes plants before he makes the sun. How, how did the plants live without the sun? If, unless it means literal days, in which case also, how was there a day and night? before there was a sun and moon to... to there's to, light you know. before there's a sun. It's, yeah, it, how, what's it's, that all about? Yeah, It's kind of banana like, balls, yeah. you know? It is it is all over the place, yo. Um, and, you know, if you really want to get pedantic about it, pick the parts where it talks about how insects have four legs. And pick the parts where it says that a bat is yeah. a bird. You know, like that's it just... Uh, there's yeah. a million things in here that are weird. And pick the part where it says that pi equals three. You know, and like, just if, if they're going to say, if, if anyone is going to say, okay, well, yeah, but what it really means is, would you accept that from anything else? If I gave you a science textbook in, in school that said bats are birds, and then it said, wow, but I didn't mean it. Like, <laughs> are you going to accept that or not? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wish you best of luck, Tyler. Seriously, I hope, I hope everything works out, and I, I hope that your deconstruction continues. Uh, Emma, do you have anything before we wrap up? No, just just read it. <laughs> just yeah. read it. It's keep, bananas. Keep on, keep on, Some yeah. of it's fun. Oh, yeah. If you like Saw not. movies, you'll love the Old Testament. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take care, Tyler. See you later, man. All right. Uh, speaking of bats being birds, by the way, um, I'm going to the Bat Cruise again this year, y'all. So come down and see me if you want to if you want to go to the bat cruise, come down and check me out. Um, and uh, please, if you can, 
make sure to, to drop a donation or a, a, a membership or a Patreon subscription or something to help the ACA out because the back cruise is kind of a big deal that they put together and it costs a lot of money. And so it would really help if you would, you know, throw, throw a little something, throw a little five bucks their way and help them put on cool events like that, where uh, uh, lots of cool people and also me can show up and, and entertain you uh, there live on a boat. I'm on a boat y'all. Um, call back to that bring back 2020 music or 2010 music um the so that was the only we we had another caller who was like a theist who was very passionately anti-evolution and that call already dropped so unfortunately you guys asked for an evolution call uh we, we can't do it um we that was that was the best we had however um, the second most popular thing you guys want to talk about in the chat poll here is a there's only two sexes call um before we do that, however, I do want to point out that, like, the AC, as far as I know, has always been a very adamantly and outspoken pro-LGBT organization. And, like, I know there have been, one of the things that I remember when I first started watching the show was, like, the amount that the hosts would go out of their way to defend LGBT people and, and to talk about bigotry, especially from Christians calling and saying, like, oh, well... Two men can't have a baby, therefore they can't have gay marriage. And people would would sit on this show and be like, "Hey, here's why." From a religious standpoint, that's fucking stupid. And also, here's the rest of it. And nobody ever like that was expected from this organization. Um, I just want to point out the fact that like I find it really, really interesting that all those same people that have supported this show for so long are now so goddamn upset when we talk about sex and gender or when we put our pronouns in our bio or anything else and they're like ah, oh, this i thought this was an atheist show it's always been a very progressive show where we talked about human rights and like the promotion of secular thinking and like not even secular but skepticism and like skepticism properly implemented would make you a pro lgbt rights person like i don't don't get the disconnect. It's just a there. hot just... button. It's just a hot button topic right now. It's the same reason that like we were to... like in the UK, we were fine with trans people being on TV ten years ago, but now it's in the papers everywhere and it's not okay anymore. Yeah, now all of a sudden it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah. wild. Like that's man. I just I, I love throwing that out there because it really it 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 pains me to see so many people who are supposedly skeptics and supposedly critical thinkers uh, buy into some really really hateful dumb thinking uh when it comes mm -hmm. to especially trans people but like all lgbt people and then be surprised when we're not gonna be on board with that who do, like, do you know who i am it's so <laughs> weird like, it's, you know what i mean like, uh anyway we've got uh i just wanted to get that off my chest because like I, I, I every time every single time we talk about in the show i can smell the comment section I'm like, oh, i thought this was an atheist show it's the same goddamn show it's been the whole time you mm -hmm. need to keep up um with that, uh, I apologize, Lee, in Australia, for having to hear me rant about that, about our problems. We've got Lee in Australia who says there are exactly two sexes and teaching otherwise is a reversal of the usual logic we employ in biology. I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on gender as well, but we'll get there. Lee, you are on AXP. How are you today? Hi, Lee. I'm doing well. How are you? Awesome. Awesome. So am I missing anything from what it says on your call screen here? Is there more nuance to what you'd like to say? Uh, well, there's, I suppose, a supporting argument that uh, would be good to say, uh, but that's okay. a concise um, summary. Fire it out. Okay, so we um, recognise that there are, if you like, species-level um, descriptions, and um, not every individual has to meet that description. For instance, we could say um, all spiders have eight legs. And we recognize that if a spider egg hatches and let's say a couple of the legs are fused together, we recognize it's still a spider, even if it doesn't meet the species level description. Or if a spider loses legs due to injury, we recognize that it's still a spider, even if it's only got six legs, seven legs, whatever. Um, similar to humans, when we talk about uh, intersex conditions, generally uh, this crops up in conversations about um, trans people, so I do know why you went on that um, 
Uh, yeah. I, I just wanted to preface this call because I could, like I said, I could already smell the comment section. I just didn't want to deal with it. I realize that may or may not apply to you. So I, I don't want you to think that I was trying to preface what you were saying, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, it, intersex people are often brought up in this sort of discussion. And mm -hmm. these are used as, if you like, a... Um, a way to weaken the person's understanding or instill in doubt, perhaps, in the person's understanding of there being only two sexes. It's pointed out that um, not everyone has, let's say, fully developed gonads or something. Uh, not everyone has um, unambiguous genitalia and that sort of thing. And so, okay, sure. yes, there are people that cannot be neatly classified as one of the two sexes. But that does not change the fact um, that there are only two sexes. The individual anomalies, shall we say, do not um, are not fatal to the species level general description. So the let me there before I loads of other at that. that sort of logic. Sure, sure. So so before we get into it too much, because I I already have some things that I want to get to, but like I just want to be make sure that I'm understanding fully what you're saying. Are we on the same page that sex and gender are different things? Do we agree on that? They're different. Different, yeah. They are Although different. I have okay. seen a slightly, slightly irritating tendency to see gender used as a synonym for sex when talking about biology. Likewise. Likewise. Yes, it, it bothers me as well. And that that's largely outdated. The difference between sex and gender and our understanding of that is damn near 100 years old. But unfortunately, it just has been so synonymous in the English language for so long that it, it, it's still pre prevalent. Even sometimes, you know, uh, biologists who should know better uh, conflate the terms. Um, I, and I've, I've done it for years and years and years, only in the past few, you know, uh, uh, since I actually just went to school and learned this stuff, have I learned to separate those terms. So, yeah, that's fine. Now, I agree. That's very irritating. Um, so we agree that sex and gender are different things. Do we agree that gender is non-binary? Well, gender is social and is not it. It does not have discrete boundaries between categories. It is changeable. It's it's cultural. Uh, mm. It can change over time and geography. So cool. it, it's whatever. Awesome. So it sounds like we're very close to agreeing on a lot of things. Um, it sounds like we agree the sex and gender are different. We agree that gender is a social construct that's not a binary state, that it's its own thing that, that morphs with culture. Um, gender, as I always like to say, it can change from culture to culture, from generation to generation, from person to person, from day to day. So it sounds like we agree on that. And we also agree that uh, intersex people are not the same as trans people and should not be used as an argument when talking about trans people. It sounds like we're on the same page in all of this so far. The hang up, it seems, um, Agreed. is that you are you are drawing a different conclusion from the data at hand. Because it does, yeah, obviously you agree that intersex people exist. Um, we can, you know, depending mm -hmm. on what which study you read or which person you listen to, there's different percentages of them in the human population. But for sure, at the most conservative estimates, we're talking about millions of people, right? Uh, yep. Uh, if we're talking Dif globally, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the 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 hang up that I'm seeing with what you're saying to me right now is that you're saying, it, and th if this sounds like a straw man, correct me. It sounds like you're speaking in favor of glossing over those millions of people in order to hold a more simplistic framework. And I agree with you that more simplistic frameworks, this that simplified model is really easy. And it's oftentimes useful when talking about, you know, uh, species in general, in the same way that the concept of a species is over simpli overly simplistic and only useful for what you're using it for, but isn't actually a real thing. And the difference, it seems, between you and my positions here, is that you're okay with saying this, this broken model that doesn't account for everything is fine because it's utilitarian and it works. And I'm saying more often than not, yeah, go ahead and use it in most biology, go ahead and use it. But when we're talking especially about human beings and human rights, that's millions of people that you cannot gloss over. It sounds like you're using typological thinking and I'm using population level thinking. 
is that a fair summary of the difference between us, do you think? Or is there something in your argument that I'm missing? I'm not sure that I would use the same wording as you. Um, do I, I might have been a little harsh. Or so, dismissing yeah. or ignore, ignoring, etc. I mean, let's bear in mind that we uh, textbooks will say uh, without controversy um, that the human species can see wavelengths between about 450 and uh, 700 nanometers. That's a relatively uncontroversial statement, even though we know that there are plenty of blind people and plenty of um, colorblind people. It's mm. just not um, a statement. We, we do not employ the logic in that topic that um, lots of exceptions mean the general statement must not be um, used. We recognize so, that they aren't. Yeah. So the, I think that's issue... a really interesting example mm. because it sort of demonstrates kind of what you were saying for us, the difference between uh, simplification for the sake of talking about science and when we're having discussions at our social, political, you know, cultural level, because blind people have suffered from being ignored in the way that intersex people have suffered from being ignored. And inclusion, I say this as a person who was shamefully completely ignorant of intersex people, what that meant. Uh, the issues intersex people faced even within the LGBT community until I met someone who was intersex and heard her story and the harrowing things that were done to her because of this need to simplify into, well, there are two sexes. This child isn't correct. We shall mutilate them to make them fit into our particular mold. So I think it is just, I don't think there's anything wrong with simplifying if you're talking to a child, if you're having a casual discussion and saying, there is male and female, but in a broader social context, I think there is great value in including intersex people. And that mm. awareness is so important. And I do say that as somebody who had zero awareness until I realized that it was actually a problem that is caused by that lack of awareness. Yeah. I think that's a great way of putting it. And and like, really, it, it sounds an awful lot like what Lee, what you're saying, it sounds an awful lot like the same kind of argument of like, oh, well, you know, if, if someone loses an arm, can we no longer say that humans have two arms or the, like the spider thing, you know, you usually started with and all these other things. And the, the cool thing is, when you are being inclusive, you are also being scientifically accurate. And vice versa, when you are being more scientifically accurate, you are being more inclusive. So like you talk about colorblind people, I would just, it, it's really easy to say most people can see white light waves in these things. In general, people can see these things. Typically, people can say these things. By and large, people can see these things. Like there's, that. it's totally fine to say that. And you would be not only more accurate, but also inclusive in doing so. And that's why, you know, in... Uh, especially um, biological anthropologists and biomedical scientists, a lot of the times, especially in those groups, you'll hear distinctions where they don't just say male or female, they say anatomical male or phenotypic male or hormonal male or uh, chromosomal male or genetic male or what they make the distinction of what they're actually talking about because these things don't always line up. Um, and this is the thing is that, you're you're right in that the binary model of sex has been used for a long time to pretty good effect and we've learned a lot of stuff with that model but just like with all models in science all models are wrong some of them are useful and this has been a useful one for a while but we got that by glossing over and ignoring anomalies and things that didn't fit that and by doing so we missed a lot of information and now in this day and age Sex differentiation, biological sex in general, is an active area of research that we're expecting more sophisticated results out of as time goes on because it's becoming abundantly clear that it's a lot more interesting than we thought it was. And no matter where you fall on this debate, which is unfortunately a debate now, no matter where you fall in this debate, what is undeniable is that sex is a multivariate system with several factors going into it. And not a single factor, not a single one of those factor is solely determinant of the outcome. And not a single one of those factors has only two options. 
So you've got something that is produced by a variety of factors. Not one of them is solely in control and not a single one of those factors is a binary. And you're looking at the results of that system and saying, yeah, but it's two things. It's binary. And I don't, I don't get how you can use that language unless you're just deliberately you know, simplifying something for the purpose of looking at it in a, like a really big picture sort of way, which isn't a bad thing to do in biology, but it is a bad thing to do in terms of human rights. Does that make sense? Um, if you're making the point to separate it um, from a... Um scientific perspective and a human rights perspective that's sort of i'm not sure if that's actually i, I would say in either well, way it's wrong right. but especially considering the political context of this conversation it's especially wrong that's that's what i would be saying because i i could understand the argument to say like well you're mixing politics with science there even in a strictly scientific perspective i would still say that's kind of a silly thing to do unless you are looking on a very big picture scale, which is why we use terms like species and clades and things like that. That's the point of that, is that I know there's a lot of variation here. I'm lumping it all together on purpose to make it easier to think about. That's what we do all the time in biology. Biology is the study of generalities, but generalities are generally wrong. Well, and so like when we talk wrong. about this, uh -huh. we can say, here's this graph and there's two big lumps here and I can name the lumps but there's still a continuum of variation between the lumps. And just because you're looking at it, the big picture doesn't mean that those millions of people don't exist and you shouldn't take them seriously. I'm not suggesting that we dismiss them or ignore them. I mean, let's... I don't think you are. I'm just being very clear about what I'm saying. Um, we, we would describe Homo sapiens as uh, diploid. I think you'll agree. Even though there are sure. aneuploides, and in fact, millions, I just looked up, 5.4 million, apparently, people with Down syndrome, which is trisomy 21. Mm -hmm. um, but we still call us a diploid species because that is, if you like, the typical or the healthy or whatever presentation of the species. Because we're, because we're speaking at the species level, yeah. Yes, species level. But I see lots yeah. of people in an education or political commentary uh, sort of platform um, saying, oh, no, the um, two-sex two model is completely dead or useless or just incorrect or whatever. But it is still the, if you like, it is the biological system by which we reproduce. It's our evolutionary history of however thousands of millions of years sex has existed um, not sure. I think there's. I think you're reading possibly it into it a little bit because I don't think that I, I. I would be surprised if the kind of people you're sort of looking at on a, a political side or an educational side would say that we don't have a history of reproducing, you know, heterosexually. I, d I don't think anybody is saying that. And I'm, I'm just sort of wondering where this is going. Um, I'm always skeptical when the, cons the the discussion around sex and gender comes up. I'm just sort of like, I feel like we've agreed. We've, we've said on a, on a big general scale, maybe that's, that's fine. Um, it is better to be more inclusive. And is there anything else to say? Or is that, can we just, are we just, yes, we, we agree on those things and that's the end of it. Or is there, is there some, are you driving at something? Well, um, there are people who are, not necessarily you two, but there are people who are pushing towards a, um, a changes in education and messaging about uh, sex and generally in support of um, trans people and um, transitioning and all that. There is a real effort to cast doubt or muddle the issue of um, sex in that they actually wish or appear to wish uh, education to actually change on the subject, to no longer say that there are two sexes. I have um, been to uni studying biology and I didn't witness this myself, but I've heard in l more recent years in university, there has been pushback from various subjects like say anthropology, uh, the mm -hmm. idea that say skeletons can be sexed by the um, pelvis, for instance or that there they is can't always as an identifiable sex. Well, I mean, it's not, it's they not, can't always. it's not, um, right. Well, 
Right. right. But no, that's 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 right. the point that's being made. So like it, what you're saying here is like, here's the thing. First of all, like I agree there are people on the extreme sides of both of this issue. And I'm not trying to both sides this whole thing, but like I have heard people say biological sex isn't even a real thing and shouldn't be caught. And that's also silly. I agree with that. But as far as saying like, well, they're trying to change the way it's taught. Yeah. They're teaching new information as we have the ability of new information. So like we've learned more, especially in the past couple of decades, we have learned a lot more about what sex actually is and how it actually works. And it turns out it's a lot more interesting the way that we have been talking about it and teaching it for the past, you know, however many 50, 60 years um, or you know, back until the beginning of teaching. Um, it's, it's a lot more interesting and a lot more complicated than that and so in the same way as like if i go into a middle school classroom and i say your dna controls your body it's it's what what makes your body what it is that's not accurate at all there's that's that's just not true but it's good enough to explain a lesson in genetics to some middle schoolers and let them understand what dna is right that's good enough for that level but if i'm at a high school level damn sure I'm going to do more than that. And I'm going to say, okay, this, this is actually how it works. And here's epigenetics as well. And here's phenotypic plasticity as well. And here's all these different things that are totally different. And if I'm at the collegiate level and I walk into the class and I say, your DNA controls your body, I'd be laughed out of the room. Like there's no way that I'm actually going to be able to. So it's the same thing with sex. If I'm at the, this lower level and I want to say, yeah, well, okay, well, there's, there's males and females. Good enough. But as you actually are teaching the real meat of this topic, it's not good enough. It just isn't. And especially when we're talking like about human beings here, this, you know, there are there may be intersex kids in that classroom. How are they going to feel if you're telling them that they don't exist? So it's worth the time to say same with your legs. Generally, humans come in two sexes, typically, by and large, more often than not. And or at the very least, just add a caveat at the end of what you're saying and say that actually this is something that we're learning right now. This is something we're learning more about. Just like back in, I think it was in the 60s when plate tectonic theory was becoming established and there was a big debate over whether we were going to teach about plate tectonics in schools. And it was just like, you know, creationism or about trans people or whatever today. And we finally had to say, all right, we're going to start this class by saying this is a new area of research. We learned some new cool stuff. It turns out the earth is made of pieces, y'all. And it's crazy. And like that, and it blew a bunch of people's minds and it was very politically contentious. Exact same thing here. It turns out sex is a lot more interesting than we thought it was. And it's a little bit more complicated than you might have heard before. So let's talk about the difference between sex, which deals with males, females, and intersex people, and gender, which deals with cultural constructs around boys, girls, men, women, and, and non-binary people. And let's talk about the differences, and let's talk about the nuance, and let's talk about how interesting it is. And there's different levels at which you do that, depending on if they're in middle school or high school or college, and, and whether they're at a biology degree or a different kind of degree, and they're just there for non-majors. There's different levels at which you're able to teach that. But you need to be teaching it because it would be a disservice to leave it out as much as it would be a disservice to ignore any other part of science just because it's politically or socially inconvenient for you to do so in a schoolroom. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Let's let's take that approach uh, where we say uh, most people and usually and for the most part, blah, blah, blah. I mean, we can imagine anatomists teaching, say, organ layout and saying, um, here's the heart, here's the lungs, blah, blah, blah. Oh, unless, uh, so, uh, apologies to all the dextrocardic people, uh, the heart can be over here. We don't do that. They do that. Um, you you can do that. And also you, you could just say generally. They do do that. That, that. No, actually, I'm doing, I am currently in the middle of a master's in biomed. My second master's is in biomed, and I'm right in the middle of it right now. And I literally just did a whole semester of clinical anatomy where we spent hours and hours a day dissecting cadavers to teach. I'm the only biologist in the room, so it's a bunch of medical students and me, right? And like, and uh, they, they've got the paleontology department and, and the biologists that work with them, and then they've got the medical side, and we're all here in this room, and we all get the same lecture and they did exactly that they talked about here's this organ and here's all the variations that we know of and here's the clinical presentations of that and here's the ones that are non-clinically significant that are just things that happen and here's the different and they yep. all when we talked about genitalia and sex organs and stuff they always made sure to make a distinction when they said 
anatomically males uh, people have this and phenotypically male presentation is that and anatomical female presentation typically is this but sometimes can be that and when we're talking about these tissues here's the homologies between these tissues on an anatomical female and these tissues on an anatomical male and here's why they're the same and here's why they're different and here's the difference between a hormonal male and a chromosomal female and a blah blah they made those distinctions because it's important for the biologists in the room and the doctors in the room, it is important for them to understand those differences. So again, you wouldn't go into that much detail in a middle school classroom, but you can for sure say that those things exist. And that's that's not only reasonable, but it should be expected. If you are teaching the clinical signs of malpresentations of this, that, and the other, and disease states, and um, let's say congenital um, conditions, uh, then yes, you're going to get into all of the exceptions. But that's not to say that as a um, species, we have a heart in a particular location. We have two copies of every chromosome, despite the existence of aneuploidies. We have, um, you know, uh, vision in this range. We have bipedalism, despite the existence of exceptions and so forth. The people who are communicating and blogging not necessarily at a large scale. Um, they're, they're attempting or their position appears to be that we need to dismantle all of this teaching, but only really for sex. The um, Can I jump in, Lee? Because oh, uh, I think I know what's going on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to postulate here, and you can tell me if I'm completely off base, and what I would like you to do is if I'm completely off base, that's fine, but I want you to cite some sources for me. I think what is happening at the moment due to the current political climate is, and the way that media institutions like to make money off of making you angry, there are a lot of headlines, very clickable headlines, about how crazy people are saying we can't even teach this. Schools are teaching this. And it is maybe a fringe internet blogger. It is driven by... <clears throat> a need to drive internet traffic to certain websites or support certain political parties. And it is so vastly exaggerated, often made up. And once you dig into the, they're actually teaching that sex isn't this, and then Forrest can go off and explain to you why sex isn't that, and that's the right thing to teach. I, I think you may be falling for the trap of shock media that is trying to trigger some knee-jerk reaction in you. And if that's not correct, if this is some sort of mainstream thing where they are teaching completely inappropriately complicated scientific things, say, to young children, I would love for you to cite that for me. I am not looking at the mainstream media on this subject because... Um... Well, then don't read blogs. Don't read fringe crazy blogs is my advice. And it's not worth bringing up and talking about because you brought it up. And Lee, and the reason I have a problem with this, I'm sorry, my lovely, it's just that you brought it up as blogs, if it is like, a mainstream fringe, thing. Yeah. And then after this lengthy discussion, I'm talking, please, Lee, after this lengthy discussion, you go, well, it's mostly the bloggers. And I don't care about that because people are using the fringe bloggers to make an issue out of what is not an issue to hurt people. And that's not okay. We don't make that mainstream. We say there's some fringe bloggers doing crazy things and we laugh at that and when we move on with our lives. Would you call, uh, say, PZ Myers fringe? Uh, he's a blogger. He's, uh, he isn't, I'm pretty sure he's an evolutionary biologist, isn't he? Yes. And last I checked, he's... He, I, I, I don't know where his stance is on this issue, um, but he's a dude who's writing a book. I am also just a dude. So like, is this, again, is this actually something that's happening in the in the real world? Yeah, cite, cite it for me, you know? Like, I'm, I'm going to look this up PZ Myers. Is... More about the... I'm talking more Tell about... Tell me what school <laughs> this is being taught in, you know? You're, you're talking about they're teaching this and that in schools. Tell me what school and I'm, where. I'm not saying... How can I find out about it? I have not claimed... I have not claimed that this is um, necessarily reaching the schools. I'm saying that there is a push. Where did I get that? I thought we talked about schools earlier. Where have I got that from? Well, I did um, talk about actually studying biology in uni, and so did Forrest. 
So it sort of went. Yeah, so right. I, I just looked it up, by the way. P PZ Myers, he he is there. I've just found very easily some blogs that he's written explaining, yes, the idea of a binary <laughs> sex is a binary sex is overly simplistic because science is much more interesting than that, which makes him one out of countless scientists on that side of the issue. And and this is a current debate right now amongst biologists, whether or not we should continue using the binary model. All of us agree on the data. We all agree this is what is actually going on. There's some of us who say that actually the utility is better than it was and we should, or better than not, and we should just keep using this model the way that it is. And there are some fringe people on the very far side of that issue that are like, every person is either only exactly male or female and everything else you, you can't. Do. And then there's the other side of the scientists who are saying this idea is overly simplistic and we need to be a little bit more nuanced in our understanding, not only for the good of science, but for the good of humanity. And there are some crazy people people on the far fringe of that side saying there's no such thing as sex at all. And so like, it sounds like you're reading people either on the farthest end of either end of this issue, talking about people on the farthest end of the other side of the issue. And like <laughs> Emma said, you're making a problem out of whole cloth, which the, the, the problem actually was just created in order to get clicks and likes at the expense of the mental and physical well-being of actual human beings. Why are you buying into that? Because none of this is actually, either it isn't a problem at all, or it isn't a bit as big of a problem as you're saying, or it isn't actually like the thing you're saying is happening, but it's a good thing. And like it, we've kind of covered all three of those options over the course of this mm -hmm. call. And the best you've given us is this typological thinking of saying, well, you know, sex is how, you know, it's, it's, or sorry, this would be tree thinking saying, well, sex evolved however many billions of years ago. And it's, it's something that's been along is how we reproduce and all this stuff, which is the same kind of dog shit argument for arguing against gay marriage that the, the, these people say, oh, well, we can't let LGBT people at all be around because then how are you going to have babies? And it's like, people aren't just machines for that. I'm sorry. It's, it's way, way, way cooler than you're giving us credit for. So where's how does the circle get squared for you, Lee? Uh, as far as I can tell, teaching institutions have not yet really moved towards this, except in some early small ways. So uh, I think um, teaching is holding out and still teaching useful, um, nuanced stuff because of being a uh, person who studied biology, I remember the um, lectures on you know, the oddities of um, genetics, um, although I sort of leaned towards immunology as my favorite bit, but never mind. When, when, did, you, um, when did you study biology? Uh, 20 years ago. So in 20 years, we've learned some and, new and stuff. And as you know, yeah. as someone who has studied biology, the history of biology is defined by us learning new things and dramatically changing our paradigms totally throwing a, the, yeah, the, the discovery of what fossils are, the discovery of evolution, the discovery of microorganisms, the, the, the mapping of the genome, all sorts of things that we've done where we had to radically change the, the structure of our models in biology and completely throw away what we thought we knew about the world because we learned a new thing. And now here we are 20 years after when you were in school and these things were just called oddities and anomalies. And we're saying, actually, this is pretty damn important. And there's a lot more here than that we didn't realize was here. And we're going back and we're reevaluating our models and we're coming up with new solutions and new ideas and uh, new ways to teach. And yes, especially in biomed and especially in uh, uh, bioanth, that comes up a lot because, like I said at the beginning, at a species level, you talk about a species. At an individual level, species means a lot less. At a community level, species means a lot less. Um, and so, like, here we are now looking at humans and you're looking at biological sex and looking at all these things, it, it, it's going to have different levels of severity, but there is going to be a change as we learn more, just as there always has been in every other topic in really all of science, but especially biology. The thing that is new is the push to um, erode uh, the, the claim that there are two sexes. I mean, I remember. That's not new. About uh, we've, we've we've done that discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's no new discovery that needs to have been radically changing the um, method of communication because we knew about 
for instance, complete androgen insensitivity for, I don't know, something like 30 or 40 years, probably longer. Um, we knew about um, hyperspadius and the scale, I forget its name, of um, uh, genital um, ambiguity, let's say. This isn't sure, really but in fact, didn't we? Did, I, I, I did point out to you earlier, Lee, that sometimes the problem with having ignored those things or maybe glossed over them, even though we have known about them for all these years, is that we end up with these bizarre cultural norms that result in people getting mutilated, not properly cared for legally. And it, I mean, Forrest summed it up perfectly earlier. Being more specific is being more accurate and more inclusive. That is a net gain. Why do you feel so attached to this idea? Is it just because you learned it and ingrained it when you were young, when you were learning, and it's difficult to relearn things? Because that is a hard thing to accept, to be fair. And we all suffer from it. But you have to get over it to have a functioning society and to function educationally to accept what is what is the new science. You know, it's a net gain to be more inclusive, to be more accurate. I see no reason for your argument. Um, well, the argument is about the um, political messaging rather than any um, dire state of current um, education. Like there are the Fox channels that say schools let you use a litter box or whatever. That's all just silly stuff. I agree that that's um, massively exaggerated bullshit. What is the political messaging it's you have a problem with? I'm going to need some what? specifics from you. It, it is the push to change education, which I uh, object to. In um, it's so why we we've right. agreed. Right. Well, I've agreed personally yeah. with myself that it's a net gain to update to all the latest science. Why I, is I this a problem? To, yeah, I was going to ask. Like, if we discovered another planet in our solar system today. Would that be an issue that we're changing? We're doing a political push to change education to include this new planet. We don't teach about Pluto anymore. 20 years ago, that was when a you debate, were in though. school. <laughs> yeah, 20 years ago when you were in school, they surely taught that Pluto was a planet. When I was in first grade, they taught me Pluto was a planet. And then we learned it fucking isn't. And so we changed education. And there was this big push to in, in the political landscape it's to decide. It's a political push. Yes. What Were you as upset about that as you are about this? Or is it just because this happens to be a politically charged topic that you've decided to plant your flag here? No, that was a, um, a a committee decision to change the definition of planet, and you know, okay, now there are eight. That's fine. Uh, I still I'm just, but but you understand the parallel here. We learn something new, and so we stop teaching the old thing that we realized isn't good anymore, and we now teach the new thing that's a lot more accurate. And some people were upset about it, and it's whatever. And here we are now again when we talk about sex. We had the old model of what we were teaching, and now we've learned some new things, and there's a big push to teach the new things. And yes, there are some people on the fringes that are like, completely destroy all of this. I'm sure there was somebody out there saying that NASA's evil and we shouldn't teach about planets at all because the Earth is flat and there's a dome over the sky and we shouldn't teach any of this. And we didn't take them seriously either. So anybody who's out here with whatever radical agenda you think is being taught in schools because some blog post wrote about it, I'm sorry, it isn't the case. At the end of the day, all we're saying is, this is new information. It's dramatically changed the way, way that we in the biological field think about this concept. And if we want to teach new biologists, then they need to know what this information is and why we think about it this way, the same we would with any other model ever. I don't understand why this one particular one is an issue for you. Okay, well, uh, so we may be at an impasse here. Um, I still think that the um, at the species level, if we can agree that there is two uh, sexes, then I'm okay with that. Um, if we can agree that there are two gametes, um, I'm okay with that. Even though, obviously, when you get um, when you zoom in, there will what's be. What's wrong with being more? What's wrong with being more specific? I feel it's, like I do feel like we're at an impasse because I feel like you came into this discussion unwilling. I feel like Forrest tackled your position especially well and you're unwavering in your belief based on whatever uh, politically motivated media you consume. I don't think you're willing to change it. So I think that's probably the best time to conclude.
It sounds to me like you're waiting for yeah. like Springer. Media, it, by the way. It sounds to me like you're waiting for Springer to release a textbook called The Spectrum of Sex. And then we can say, okay, here it is. Here now, okay, biologists are agreeing that this is a thing. And then, well, it's, is that like where we're at? Or, or is it just no matter what, never, you're, you're never going to be okay with this being a new thing? Uh, I don't actually think we need to um, say that it's a new thing because it is still a division between uh, species level and clinical exceptions for this and that individual. And if we can observe or if we can keep in mind that distinction, then I'm sort of okay with it. Call it a partial agreement, partial disagreement. I, I don't okay. think there's a lot for it. Yeah, sure. I don't think there's a I lot to go the end. there, man. I think yeah, that's the end, Lee. On, Thank you very much. I will say after we've, we're, we're going to end this Lord. call here, I will say what, like, I used some terms um, while Lee was on the phone is I talked about tree thinking and typological thinking and, and, and things like this. I've talked about this on this show before, but in case anybody's still watching and they curious to know what I'm talking about, that, what I think is important here, I'll be very brief. Um, there's different kinds of thinking in science, different, the same way there's different martial arts for different situations. Um, there's different questions in science, different things you're doing as a scientist, you use different types of thinking for it. So like typological thinking is, I need to know what an animal cell is and what a plant cell is. So this one's a circle and this one's a square. And this is what a plant cell looks like. And this is what they have in them. And this is what they do. And an animal cell has this, a nucleus and has the, these and these and, the, and like, that's really good for understanding a big concept. It doesn't work when you're actually getting down into the nitty gritty of the field. The, oh, an animal cell, oh, they have, a, they have a, a DNA in them and they have nuclear. Okay, what about red blood cells? Those don't have DNA. Are they not animal cells? Is there a difference? You know what I mean? And so really good for big concepts, not super good for like trivial details and, and like for understanding, actually being able to identify things on a, on a big scale, all the nuance and the fuzzy gray areas around stuff. Tree thinking is when you're thinking in terms of like evolution. I see an animal with wings. Okay, well, I think back to how many times wings have evolved and when they evolved and like in what types of species they evolved. And now I immediately know more about this animal because I'm thinking about the utility, the function, the evolutionary history of a thing. Super cool stuff. Doesn't really help in, in you know, individual situations where so you, know, you, you, you can't apply that kind of evolutionary model to something. It's, you know, like we talked about here talking about sex and saying, well, it evolved for this reason. Therefore it has to do this. I, I, you know, I have never once used sex for the purpose of reproduction. I don't give a damn what it's evolved for. I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, and so like, it's, I, I'm, I've been doing it wrong for years and I, I won't stop. And so then there's also what I advocate for is population thinking popular in, in this particular case. Population thinking um, is where you actually look at the whole population, the whole bell curve, um, and you look at the whole variation within a population, within a whole species, whatever. What do the data actually show? Um, and that sucks when you're trying to think about like typological stuff. It is not good to say, what does an animal cell look like? Here's all of them. It's just not a good idea to do that. Um, but it's really important, like say, for example, um, in cancer research, cancer cells uh, evolve through clonal evolution. If you're looking at a tumor and you say, okay, so here's the population and what they're able to do. And here's this side of the bell curve over here. That's a little bit better at, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, sequestering resources and a little bit better at moving a new territory. This is now where I'm concerned about metastasis over here. Like, Th this kind of research is really big on that kind of population level thing. Same thing with genetics, same thing with the most evolution. You, the, if you're doing like the, um, you know, observable evolution experiments, not long-term evolution experiments, but like things you can see. Um, and that kind of research, population thinking is big. And so what I'm saying here is when you're talking about biological sex, especially in humans, quit using typological and tree thinking, quit trying to put people into two tiny boxes and quit trying to say, you need to do the thing you evolved to do because you would never do that with anything else. Just do the same population thinking that you would usually use for this level of thinking in biology. You're using the wrong tool and there's a reason why you're getting the wrong answer, in my opinion. Um, you should be using this other kind of thinking and looking at it from a more broad, you know, multifaceted 
perspective. And as we talked about with Lee, sex is a multivariate system without a single determining factor and without a single factor with two options. So how are you going to look at that and say, yeah, no, that that all means two. You can't. And I, I don't I don't see how anybody can. But that's we've been on this for a while and I don't want to rant for the can rest I give of the my, show. Can I give my much quicker uh, no do. science words <laughs> roundup? Here is my position and the reason that I got a little bit fresh uh, with Lee. I hope he's not too offended. I we, we had done the science. We had agreed that it is uh, more complex than just male and female and that it is appropriate in lots of situations to express that and teach that. Then I described the way in which it is deeply harmful to a very large population of people to be so aggressively keen to oversimplify. And Lee did not have any interest in considering that and discussing that. And the human aspect of that is the most important thing for me, especially when it is such a politically charged topic. And I am just so not willing to budge with someone who doesn't care <laughs> once you say okay we've ticked the science we've done the science bit we sort of agree on these you know you're defining it in a different way here's the human problem here's the people who are harmed i don't care move on it's not a it's not a worthwhile discussion in my opinion because that's somebody who's not going to change their mind on a 10 minute phone call i i yeah i agree with that wholeheartedly and i i think it's worth pointing out i've mentioned this on the show before like i have like a dozen textbooks within arm's reach of me that talk about non-binary sex that talk about the difference between sex and gender that talk about how the because that's part of getting a biology degree at this point in history we learn about this shit and i mentioned at the end of the call i said it sounds like you want a springer textbook called the spectrum of sex i was being facetious because like i have one <laughs> and like that this is a springer textbook about how sex isn't a strict binary and they've got you know just loads of papers in here that i i, I love this is the the very end of uh let's see here the very end of the preface i i've read on you know, there before um the environment it's, it talks about um uh, part one's going to do this, part two's going to do this. The environment surrounding organisms such as symbiosis and metabolism acts on sex and critical factors, blah, 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 blah. And they end this with this creates a sex spectrum. Like they explain like how this goes. We're beginning to draw a larger picture of how sex can be understood in terms of individuals and evolution. This picture is beyond the classical view that the sex determinant and sex hormone can serve uh, among limes initiate, uh, uh, sorry, no, among organisms initiate establish and fix females and males interwoven mechanisms allow for two types of sex inter exchange with graded phenotypes this manifests as a sex spectrum like th this is not freaking news if you're if you're into science this is not a crazy new radical thing but if you're into just watching fox news all the time which i know he said he doesn't but like if you're into just listening to political reactionary shit then yeah it's very shocking um in the same way as like, you know, we talk about uh, uh, the, you had mentioned how, you know, a few years ago, it was no worries to talk about trans people, to see trans people. everything, And now all of a sudden it's this dangerous, you know, extreme thing. Mm -hmm. I feel it's the same way with this. It, it's the same way as it was with climate change. It's the same way as it is with any time science becomes politicized is that we've been talking about it for decades. We've all been on the same page. We all agree on what the data says. But now, very suddenly, you can get angry on television and make a living about this. So mm -hmm. now it's going to be a big freaking problem that we all have to argue over. And I don't get why. It's it's frustrating. <laughs> uh, we've got a ton of other calls on the line, and there's no way we are going to be able to get to all of them at all. Um, however, we also have a great many Super Chats as well um ah. hold on wait there it is it's that we've got uh quantum answer uh who sent in uh 200 check dollars thank you for sending uh 200 all the way from there um now we need a british accent forest i don't think ah. anybody wants that that'd be a oh, bad I time do. I, I, I do I, and i'm yeah. your guest ah you know what <laughs> Um, it's, it's, 
uh, it's not going to be good because all I know about British accents is things that I see on TikTok and people throughout. Like, it's, it's it's just not as good as anybody else is in it. Like it, it, in it, in it, it's, it's not, just not. Yeah, it won't be good at all because I don't practice TikTok and I don't try it. Oh, thank you. It it's, good. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's bad. It's real bad. I, I don't try to do it, and so to, to try to do it now is a bad situation. Um, <laughs> We got a uh, Fern Love Bond uh, sent two dollars, like the cool people do, but cheaper. I don't know what that means, but I'm sure it was contextual to what I was saying or doing at that time. Thank you for the two dollars, <laughs> Gary Bierman. Two dollars from uh, oh, sorry, it says hello from Bocas del Toro, Panama. The mouths Ooh. of the bull is cool. what a what a place. That's a thing to name a town the bull mouths um monkey at typewriter sends another five dollars we've got lizard lick here in, in the u.s um five dollars uh oh is the advice from your pa- uh, is <laughs> i know what this is about to be um five dollars monkey at typewriter oh is that the advice you have for parents for us tell emma about the other recommendations you've given hashtag this man wants to dissect my boy <laughs> um yeah so uh monkey at typewriter is a is a fan um, who, who loves to let people know that uh, one time I was on a Patreon call over for the line uh, and he asked what to do, like raising a child with one religious parent and one non-religious parent. And while I don't remember doing it, I don't d- deny the fact because it sounds very much like something I said. Apparently my advice was to dissect the boy. Uh, and and uh, we, I don't know where the conversation went before or after that, but apparently that's what happened. And yeah. Um, if, you know what though? For all I know, this person still hasn't tried it. So how are you going to come at me like I'm wrong? <laughs> so you've at least given it a shot. <laughs> I'll be, I will donate. I've got within arm's reach for reasons that I have no intention of disclosing. I've got my personal dissection tools right here <laughs> and we can get to work. <laughs> Learn some things oh, about no. children. Watch that get clipped by the next Christian channel. We've got uh, Mario Bartolome Seaman uh, sent uh, $7. This is the best atheist experience I've tuned into. Jesus put his oh. face on bottles and wine during his teen years. Love that. Ruben Manzo sent five ass dollars. Uh, my answer to the question of the week, calculus. I know it's uh, that's wrong because calculus didn't exist until the 1600s. Wasn't there? I may be lying. I'm going to double check. I seem to remember them doing like some like x-ray of some like ancient paintings and they found like what would have been calculus and then they just ran out of paper so they painted over it and did some stuff <laughs> it's, yeah i don't know um everybody looked that up and if it's wrong tell me i'm stupid in the comments uh michael <laughs> bell sent five dollars love you both long time atheist but uh just found the channels damn bible belt yeah i i live there too and it's it's a bad time i don't recommend it storm elf sent five dollars i love both of you thanks for the great show never stop learning little ducks don't fucking call me a duck. <laughs> that's, that's my people. That's my oh, thing it? that oh, you're insulting okay. right now. I, I so aggressively. Just, I thought some random person just called us little ducks. I was about to lose it. Um, in the UK, got, calling someone duck is a term of endearment, typically in the North. Is it? Mm. My dad uh, uh, called... Nice. My dad called me a uh, uh, ducky. It was, that was his pet name for me. And he was from Aww. Austria. He was from Austria and he never, oh. uh, I, I don't know what, what that bridge was, but like, that was a weird thing. Um, so I'm learning new things. I thought he was just very strange. He was very strange, but I thought he was also very strange about that. Susan Robertson sent $2 and 79 cents all the way from the frozen hellscape of Canada saying no clever comment. Thank you so much for your colorful last dollars. We'll enjoy every one of them. Uh, Modi Khan sent uh, $4 and 99 cents. Nope. Is nope. It- nope. What? Not that one. Not that one. Oh, flip. Okay, cool. I'll just skip that one. <laughs> skip. I, I hadn't read it. Um, I'm sh- I'll read it later and see why I was supposed to skip it. Um, Pip Moykin uh, sent okay. two euros. Um, can we get an episode with Forrest, Emma, a symbol, probably an ampersand, and Erica? Um, yeah, I don't know if Erica's ever been on the show for but if she if she'd be amicable, I'm into it. Oh, hey, no, cool. I see the big I see the big <laughs> announcement there. Don't read that one. Cool. Thank you. 
Thank you for catching it. Thank you to our, our chat person for, for catching it uh, later on. <laughs> just know that I'm exceedingly dumb and I just read things in a straight line like Ron Burgundy. So like if you, it's a new if you system. put it on, it's a new system. Yeah, if, <laughs> if you put it on here, um, uh, what do we got here? Um, uh, this, these are all, this is us talking. These are all uh, Joshua McVeigh sent uh, $4.99. Uh, this is my first time watching live. Cheers to my favorite content creators as hosts. Uh, well, thank you so much for watching. Meridian oh. Heights sent five. They're probably down there at the bottom of this chat. Like freaking shut up. Finally, please move on. <laughs> Meridian Heights sent $5. Any chance of Forrest and Dawkins having a friendly debate slash discussion about uh, science of trans disagreements? Uh, the bad blood breaks my heart. Yeah, it's, I wouldn't. I would be amicable to it. He's never reached out to me, but he 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 is in conversation with people that I know that we've had this d- discussion disagreement with. So I know people who are currently talking to him about it, who have asked me for resources to pass along. I've never talked to him, um, but I'd be open to it because man, that dude was my hero for a long time for his his arguments about um, religion and about evolution. And it, it sucks to see what, in my opinion, is him going out of his way to not apply the same kind of rigor to this that he has for so long. And I, I also know that there's a lot there about, you know, he's, he's been, he's been problematic with other things, but who hasn't in a career as long as his, um, and it's, yeah, but it's just, uh, I'm not saying no to that, but I don't have the dude's phone number. Um, Ethan Lockwood Morris sent four pounds and 99 poundlets what uh omg not only able to catch my favorite host but also emma thank you uh both for all that you do i adore the content you both make thank you so much for watching Uh rose max sent uh 10 brazilian dollars um to all the brazilers nope Okay. Um, uh, reals? Re, 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 re. Real. I'm pretty sure, yeah. Resend. Brialas. Brialas. Yeah. I'm thinking like, is it re, Rios? It's, it's, it's 10 Brazilian Rio de Janeiro's, is what they said. <laughs> That's so stupid. I just wanted to thank you both for great work on spreading truth. By the way, Elma, uh, Elma, Elmo. <laughs> hey, by the way, Elma, miss your videos on Kent. Um, do you have a thing to say to them, Elmo, that you'd like to pass along? Uh, I, I, I enjoyed some of making videos on Kent. By the time I was on like my third video of his, he was still saying the same things over and over again, and I had already replied to them, and I have nothing else to say. But you know what? You probably haven't seen my video where I am dressed up as Ken at a dinosaur experience because nobody watched it. So if you miss Kent's stuff, you can go to my channel and watch that instead. It's got me playing the harmonica badly, trying to do the Jurassic Park theme tune. It's a little plug. I love it. I love it. Um... <laughs> We've got a uh, quantum answer uh, gifted 10 more atheist experience memberships, just slinging them out. Fliff, fliff, not even counting it. Uh, <laughs> Fern love bond sent $2. Thank you, Emma, for pushing back for us. And they got a trans flag and a heart in there. That's so sweet. And they send another $2. Thank you for us for trying to educate them in the same symbols. It's very kind of you. We're happy to be of service. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, Dragoslav Claudia, uh, uh, uh new member. That's very cool. Um, uh, new member. Uh, this is so so from Romania. They sent uh, twenty five uh, Romanian dollars. What kind of dollars they use in Romania? Uh, it says it says L E U here. Um, and twenty five Romanian Lewises. Thank you very much, uh, Dragoslav Claudia. You, you what an awesome name ruben monzo send another five ass dollars uh, they have now put in parentheses this means australian dollars i'm not reading that shit it's five ass dollars pluto <laughs> was demoted as a planet because planet was specifically redefined to exclude pluto yeah dude um and then finally uh three uh lenny sent uh three dollar three euros and 14 uh your you were lit. Uh, plot twist they're exactly pie sexes and just as i was <laughs> saying the last one uh we got god damn it stop stop giving us money we got no g- don't g- stop norp florbson i love that uh what a name. ten dollars 
Um, is there gamification of evolution and epistemology looking to use slash make something like brilliant STEM ed web app? Uh, oh, gamification, like making games of it. Um, I'm actually, my main YouTube channel is sponsored by brilliant. So go to brilliant.org slash forest and sign up now using my link. <laughs> uh but don't actually do it on one of my videos instead so I, and then go watch that video because i don't i don't get a kickback um i don't know um i know there's there's channels like i think primer is a channel on youtube that had made like cool little like evolution simulations and things like that i don't know if there's actually games that are uh, adequate um but i'm sure there are um and then Ruben Manzo sent five more ass dollars watching for us trying to navigate the different currencies. Remind me of the guy on Wilty who didn't know lambs were baby sheep. I don't know what Wilty is because I'm would a red blooded American. Oh, what yeah. I lied to you. I That's actually do like show. that show. No, I yeah. like that one. Not as good as <laughs> Cast Does Countdown, though. I can watch Cast Does Countdown all day long. It's That's the good. Best. It's I I I it's not as good after Sean Locke died, but like, dear God, those oh, old episodes are sad. the ass. Dude. <laughs> The, the one where they asked him, like, what was the most fun thing he'd ever done? He was like, it's probably that time I went seal clubbing. And it was just it was so good. <laughs> so freaking funny. Oh, man. Uh, that dude was my hero. I loved him. Mm. Um, so uh, with that, we have uh, about 15 minutes left in the show. We're already over time. Um, do you want to do one more quick call? Let's do one more. Okay, cool. Um, we've got... Um, let me see here. Let me see here. Let me see here. Which one looks good? Yes, 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 yes. You want to talk about abortion? That seems lighthearted <laughs> yeah. and fun. That sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is the, the third most requested topic from the chat poll. So we'll do it. We got Hayden, uh, pronoun she, her calling in from Arizona. would like to talk about, uh, uh, my specifically biological backing for, uh, uh, about abortion, but also would I be pro-choice, but I think there's a lot more than just the biology to say there. So Hayden, you are on AXP. How are you today? Hey, I'm doing really well. How are you guys? I'm doing fantastic. Thank, thank you. you so much for, for waiting for so long. Yeah, no, I know. I'm like sitting here um, and I got to pee, but so I'm glad oh, no. for like for like two hours. You've been uh, sitting there waiting. I'm so sorry. It's been a struggle. It's OK. It's OK. It's worth it. Um, first and foremost, <laughs> I just really want to thank you guys for everything that you do. Um, so you per you personally helped me in my deconstruction um, slash not being able to find a good reason that there is a God. So, um, I, I love how you always say forest. I love how you always say in science, um, you don't accept the hypothesis. You fail to, re um, you fail to reject it. And I feel that is how I view religion. Like I'm failing yeah. to find a good reason to believe in it. So anyways, um, so I actually, and that's not uh, just me saying that, that actually I, is the rule. <laughs> that is how you do it. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. It's just helped me so much. Um, so real quick, grew up super conservative, very, very pro-life. I am now pro-choice. Um, so it started a couple years ago. I work in the funeral industry, and we had a little girl who came into our care who passed away from neglect. And that's when I began to question, like, why is this better? Um, so, but I officially came across the uh, pro-choice stance because of bodily autonomy. Um, that makes sense to me. I'd hope that I'd have an option to have an abortion if it threatened my life or if I just didn't want to continue in with it. So anyways, um, I heard one time you say, Forrest, that uh, you could make an argument for uh, both pro-life and pro-choice from a biological standpoint and just from like a point of like, learning. Um, I was super interested in that. So I was really wanting to hear what you have to say from a biological standpoint um, for to like back pro choice. That makes sense. Yeah. So I, I, I think I might have misspoke if that's if that's what you heard me say, I, I might have, what I what I usually say is that from a biological standpoint, I could make a good argument for life beginning at fertilization, at implantation, oh, at, okay. at, at birth you know it's fine it's it's, it's at, at a certain time in pregnancy say a heartbeat say brain something whatever i could also make the argument um and and, and be all that is you know at fertilization you have a new recombination of human dna and therefore it's a unique genetic system 
argument against that. I brush out a few dozen of those every time I brush my teeth in the morning and nobody cries about it. So like, it's fine. Um, uh, talk about, you know, heartbeats or things like this, that you could make an argument for that as some sort of viability. You could also be more realistic about the fact that like at that time, that fetus looks like a wad of snot and it is a not a person. It's, it's you, what you call a heartbeat is you know, electrical activity among certain cells, it's not a freaking heart. Just because it's a heartbeat doesn't mean that it's a heart beating, right. um, if that makes any sense. Um, and uh, I could make the argument that you, until you're born, you're, you're not a, you're your own person of which, you know, that because kids die during childbirth all the time. Good counter argument to that is that, you know, those kids were still alive, definitely. Um, and I could also make the argument that like, life never started in the first place for this kid because life is an unbroken chain going back 4.6 billion years the sperm was alive the egg was alive the 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 you know, zygote that it produced was alive these are all living things and so putting any arbitrary delineation on where life starts is kind of silly and at the end of the day it's kind of just a fuzzy thing and we we know for sure that a baby is a baby and we know for sure that a sperm is not a baby and an egg is not a baby and somewhere in between there there's a fucking baby and we're not sure where but like it's it's in there and that's and we can disagree to do whatever um the argument that i make to be for being pro-choice and 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 for bodily autonomy and for um access to safe and effective and legal abortions um is that literally none of those biological arguments matter in the slightest my thoughts about abortion have zero to do with my my you know uh, being a biologist, so that, that nothing is in there. I I will grant all the way back to the second, like the, the the second you consider having a baby, that baby is now a full person. Like that, all the way as far back as you want, complete total human rights for that baby. That does not give you the right to live inside someone else's body without their consent. It, my, my mother right. is my biological mother. She actually, I I was uh, she had me in her and i look just like this it, it, it's for for a long time and and it was a bad it was horrible for everyone involved um and uh, uh then she pooped me out uh because that's how and like and she has the same blood type as me um if i need a kidney i can't go take it from her if if, if i needed blood right. right now and i stabbed a needle into her and started using her blood to sustain myself she is my literal mom who actually gave birth to me, who shares a significant amount of my DNA, who, who has the same blood type as me, even if it ended up in me dying, she could pull that tube out of it and be like, mm -hmm. you're not taking my shit, dude. You're not taking my blood. I'm not interested. No, you're not allowed to just use my body. And so if you're saying that she could not have done that while she was pregnant with me, then that would mean that I had special rights as a fetus that I don't have as a person. And that's, I think, a silly argument. I'm willing to grant a fetus all the rights in, of, of any other person. No other person gets to use somebody else's body for themselves. And so to say that right. would mean that you have more rights as a baby. And if, if you are born with a uterus, you suddenly have less rights after being born. But then after you die, at least in this country, I know if you want to be an organ donor, you have to sign up before you die. So if, if I if you and I have the same I blood type. And, and, <laughs> yeah. So if, if you're about to die and I'm yeah. already dead and you need my heart and I didn't sign up as an organ donor, we're both dying. It's that's it. Which means that a literal corpse has more rights than somebody who happens to have been born with a uterus in this country. And so you would have to say that any any anatomical female in our is is they have more rights before they're born and more rights after they're born and while they're alive they've lost those rights. What the fuck is that? And like that I think is a much less tenable position. So like I said, I can make a million arguments from a biological perspective. Not a single one of them changes the fact that uh, right. nobody should have any more rights than anybody else. Human rights are not an age issue um, for me. And so uh, I don't think that a, a baby should be allowed to live inside of a person just because it would result in the baby's death to not do that. That person still gets to decide what they do with their body. Um, and if it, it's, it's not murder to stop using your vitality to sustain someone, even if that results in their death. That's very different than actually going and killing a person or like deliberately starving them of food or something like that. You're just not letting them use your body as a house. That's a reasonable thing right. to say. 
Uh, anyway, that's everything for me. Emma, I'm sure you have something a lot more concise and compassionate to say uh, that, that's less ridiculous, please. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I think it's interesting because this, uh, this conversation has come up when I was on an ACA show before with somebody arguing, uh, a, you know, a pro-life position, which I do, I, I'm trying to avoid saying pro-life because I think that that is a, a bit of a contentious term. Um, forced birth, uh, maybe. Um, but uh, it, it becomes clear uh, as soon as you boil it down to the specifics, like like you said, of just the the legal ramifications of abortion rights, it becomes sort of farcical. And the discussion I've had with um, forced birthers on this subject, like on this show, has basically devolved to, well, would you would you be comfortable with other people having the right to take your bone marrow? And they've said, no, obviously not. Right. But when it's a person with a uterus and a fetus, then it's okay. And it, it's it boils down to ideological can be religious a lot of the time you will explain the biological arguments and it won't help a lot of the time you'll explain the legal ramifications you can talk about it the way that you talk about um you know the the fact that abortions will likely not uh, actually reduce just safe and legal and accessible abortions will reduce um and the risks of that and and generally people who are hard on that position will not shift because it is an ideological sort of entrenched thing right so super useful to know and i'm going to steal some of forest's analogies but it, it might not be a gold <laughs> ticket <laughs> well and that's and it's definitely like why i was calling coming from like an education like just like genuinely wanting to learn um because i mean even like i grew up a creationist and for the first time in my 27 years of life i'm learning about evolution through forest and like i'm like holy cow so i just feel like there's so much like knowledge out there that's been like uh kept as a secret from me um for in the name of like a god that i'm like holy crap what else don't i know um, so I think, I think that that's definitely why I was calling in. Um, but it's also funny because I was talking to a, a guy the other day about this and I realized from a pro-choice like standpoint, how frustrating it is talking to a man that who is pro-life. Like I am like, holy crap. Like, that's really great that you think that, but at the same time, like, what if I was going to die? You still don't think that I have the right for that to save my own life. Um, and he was saying that. Uh, like, well, you know, you, you caused it because you were, uh, showing, you were engaging in, uh, like consensual sex and whatnot. And I was like, okay, but like, showed your filthy ankles to the world. (laughs) I know my gosh, um, how horrible. Um, but I was like, okay, well let's like, let's say you stabbed me and I'm now bleeding out and you're the only you know, blood, you're the only blood type that matches mine. Like, should you then be forced to give me your blood because you caused it? And he's like, well, no, like that. And I was like, well, then that's exactly what I'm saying. And like kind of going off of what you were talking about, Forrest, is that it's like, it's still a right to bodily autonomy. And that ultimately was the catalyst for making me a thousand percent pro-choice from not even like it having to be because I was kind of wavering like okay if someone's poor then sure if someone's you know gonna die then like maybe or rape whatever but now I'm at the point where it's like no absolutely for I don't think that a woman should have to give a reason to make that choice um Mm -hmm. so and also I know we're running out of time I just wanted to tell you guys too I think it's funny that Christians use the Bible to say that it's pro-life, but I would encourage both of you to read Numbers 5, where it talks about the adulterous wife. Have have you, do you know about this? Yeah. If if you suspect your wife has cheated on you, you do this magic ritual where you put dirt in a glass. And if, if, if she had been incest, uh, uh, adulterous, she'll have an abortion. And it's like, dude, I don't know what to tell you. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, how can you say that the Bible is pro-life when there's literally that directed from God to say, like, to allow an abortion? To, I'm just like, I can't. Okay. So, anyways, I didn't know if you guys knew about that or not, but that blew my mind. And I'm pretty sure. Oh. And I'm pretty sure the Bible also says that life starts when you have your first breath, as well, outside of the womb. So, like, 
yes. you know, this whole babies are, yeah. ba- you know, until it does. Like, and there's also, also, there's also a, a part, I can't remember which book it's in, where um, it very clearly equates it, um, if a woman is attacked and her unborn child dies, the equivalent punishment is not equivalent to murder because that's not yes. a person. Um, exactly, there's there's yeah. quite a lot of evidence oh, in the oh Bible that God. is pro-choice, Probably essentially. Yeah. And that's and that's one of the reasons why. Fun fact: this was never like a Christian thing for the, for most of America's yeah. for most of the history of this debate. Catholics, especially, were very pro-choice, and then through lobbying and po- social and political pressure, it became a Christian argument to be pro-life. And it's so silly. Anyway, um, yeah, this uh, everything you're saying makes sense, and I'm really happy for it. We do have kind of a hard cutoff, so we've got to go move on. But thank you so much, Hayden. I really appreciate okay, you okay, calling. Okay. And, and thank you, Hayden. Yeah, thanks so much for waiting for so long. She's Guys, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Hey. Please Take go care. pee. <laughs> yeah, All right. F's in the chat for Hayden's bladder. Uh, <laughs> so with that, um, that's that's everything. We've got really quickly um, uh, a couple of super chats really quick. We got My Kind of Voice uh, sent uh, to $20. Um, have loved you guys ever since I found out of your existence. Keep being ducks. Don't tell me what to do. Um, Fus <laughs> Rohans sent uh, $2. Kevin sent $2. Love you too. Never sent money before. Thanks for doing it now. Do it again. It's hey. a lot of fun. Um, We've got uh, Ruben Manzano sent five more ass dollars. If you donate an organ, you no longer have the organ. If you're pregnant, you keep the uterus afterwards. <laughs> anyway, with siblings is proof of this. Unfortunately, siblings do exist. You're correct. Fire Chicken 42 sent uh, uh, $10. Uh, Forrest, thoughts on a recently discovered early human species, Homo floresiensis. That's not a recent discovery. Uh, nicknamed the Hobbits um, because their estimate height was around. Yeah, uh, that's not a new discovery at all. They've been around for a while, and we used to think that they evolved from Homo erectus, but now it looks like they might have actually rafted over to uh, Indonesia directly from Africa all by themselves and Homo erectus found them uh, during the Out of Africa 1 event 1.8 million years ago. Really freaky shit, dude. That's a cool case of island Ooh. biogeography. Look it up. Um, and uh, that's everything from the Super Chats and also that one Super Chat mm. that we weren't, uh, 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 that I was asked not to read. Um, just for people to know what was going on, it's because it was about a topic that will immediately get you fucked up and demonetized and shut down on YouTube uh, because of, of guidelines issues. Um, and so all I will say in response to that comment is that if you're looking for charitable organizations, this is one, but also Doctors Without Borders and Save the Children are really, really good charitable organizations that I like and support. Those are things that you will understand in context. Um, anyway, with that... Uh, that's about everything for our show today. Emma, do you have anything you want to say before we wrap up? Anything you want to promote? Anything you want to talk about? Uh, go to my channel, Emma Thorne. Yes. Um, if you go to my community tab, you can find a link to buy a Rainbow Demon plushie. Uh, it's a really good thing to just have loitering around your house if you have evangelicals you want to distress mildly. Uh, and it's cute and fluffy and will be your friend. And uh, yeah, subslime to my channel i'm not as smart as forest but i make the jokes sometimes i love that uh and <laughs> while you're there uh, uh, also do, do mine too go subscribe to, to my dumb ass and hear me talk about this really stupid things uh it, it, all the time it, it, uh, i teach if you like science atheism and general weirdness go look up Forrest Valkai here on them YouTube machines. Um, and with that, okay. uh, that's the end of our show. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks so much for being a part of it. Oh, fuck. Watch Talk Heathen Live Sundays at 1 p.m. Central. Visit tiny.cc slash YTTH and call into the show at 512-991-9242 or connect to the show online at tiny.cc slash call TH.